I don't know if you got all of that, but at the last graduation, um, I really embarrassed myself. The registrar asked me, what are you doing on your phone? It's graduation. And, and trying to sound digitally lit literate. I said, no, I'm tweeting on TikTok about the graduation. I, I, I received exactly the same reaction from her. And up to this day, I still don't know what is wrong. I'm tweeting on TikTok. Or as they say these days, you exit not tweeting, colleagues and uh, uh, representatives of your institutions, participants, both in physical form and very aptly uh, online, digit on digital platforms. Warm greetings as we gather for our hybrid colloquium, Digital Horizons Transforming Higher Education. When I thought about this colloquium and my level of digital literacy and my mastery of technology, I was so glad that I'm stepping down next year. It's a brave new future, but it's not one that I have to face. With a shared vision and a collective ambition, all of you, and all of our institutions stand at the threshold of this exciting journey towards the comprehensive digital transformation of higher education. This, the sphere of digital transformation extends well beyond the mere integration of novel technologies. It heralds a fundamental shift in how we interact, how our systems communicate, and how we nurture digital literacy within our communities. Your host today, Professor Liz Archer, um, I was very skeptical and highly, highly concerned about chat, GPT, and the potential abuses of that. And so she came around to my house one day and shared a presentation with me and demonstrated the usefulness of chat, GPT. Please don't ask me for a reference letter because these days I use chat, GPT to write my reference letters. In recognizing the importance of this transformation, the University of the Western Cape has identified digital transformation as a pivotal cross-cutting area in our five-year institutional operating plan. Our position as part of the Cape Higher Education Consortium, together with the Western Cape government and the other major public universities propels us into a strategic discussion about the digital metamorphosis of higher education. Each one of you here today, each one of our partners that will be presenting today have their own strengths to add to this dialogue and to this colloquium. The University of Cape Town, with its emphasis on research-driven innovation, the University of Stellenbosch, often lauded for excellence in integrating technology into teaching and learning. The Cape University of Technology, known for its practical, digital-focused solutions. The Cape Higher Education Consortium, together with the Western Cape Partners and the Western Cape Government, contributes with essential policy insights. Today's gathering is a testament to all of our shared commitment. 
It brings together representatives from over 60 diverse public and private institutions across South and Southern Africa. We have over 500 participants. Remember I told you that Professor Archer shared chat GPT with me? So I searched it for a joke to share with you. I still don't get the joke, but I'm sure you will. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change a world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has ever changed the world. Not such a small group today. And so we're looking to you to change the future of higher education, the future of teaching and learning, and the future of research. Let us spark our imagination and envision a future where technology empowers teaching and learning, enables path-breaking research, and nurture deeper connections with our diverse communities. Let's embrace this opportunity to shape the digital future of higher education together, a future that I don't want to be part of. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Archer. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Prof. Um, as Rector and Vice-Chancellor, I think uh, Professor Pretorius is a bit different than most, open to new technologies and new ideas, and something that he won't tell you, he was actually one of our top 10 researchers last year. So uh, yes, he really earns his place at the head of the institution. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we're going to get right into it. Uh, you guys know the drill about cell phones, etc. Uh, and the most important information that you need to know at the colloquium, unless you're online, is um, the toilets are just that way. Okay. So that's the most important thing. Um, then the next thing is just to introduce our first speaker. Uh, we're privileged to have Mr. Neil now, uh, sorry, Neil Naidu, uh, to come and present for us at about UCT. And he's specifically speaking about research-driven innovation for digital transformation. Thank you very much for presenting today. That goes fine. Can I, Prof, can I start? Okay. Lovely. So, um, Thank you, and it's really a privilege to speak here today. My name is Nal Naidu. Um, I've spent the bulk of my career in, in academia in a, in a dual role, one in being a traditional lecturer. So looking at teaching and learning and research around strategy, corporate finance and innovation management. And around 2020, I moved to the technology transfer office to build out their uh, venture support for the deep tech spin-offs. So I have a specific domain knowledge in the management and commercialization of deep tech. So these are frontier technologies that have high technical risk, difficult to implement, high market risk, difficult to find a customer, and also high financial risk, difficult to actually find funding. So what I wanted to do today was really show you two case studies that come from my research portfolio, and then a third uh, case study that comes from uh, mechanical engineering technology. The first two case studies really focus on marketing. The third one really looks at supply chain. So from an academic position, uh, Accenture had this great question that they, that they used to ask from 2014. It really asked executives, describe the pace of the digital transformation. And, and what they saw was that it consistently increased from 2014 to 2019, that it was accelerating and, at, at a significant rate. And then COVID happened, and then it changed the way that we do business. Companies had to reinvent the way that they, that they sell, so unlocking new markets and, and identifying new, new uh, customers, as well as the supply chain. So really reimagining the supply chain, making it more cost efficient through automation, but also making it more dynamic. So it's evolving and changing with the changing environment. Right. So 
just some philosophies on how to actually go about digital. So the first thing is really exploration, understanding what are the technologies that are coming, what are the technologies that are that are what we call frontiers so emerging. You've got to really experiment with them. So iterate, iterate, iterate until you find an application. Once you found that application, it becomes value adding. You start to move into what we call digital conquering. So you've developed the domain knowledge. And once it becomes part of your, your core business, right? So you have a huge competitive edge, you start to live this digital experience. And this becomes a big competitive advantage for companies because talent moves to there. And once you've got the talent and the knowledge, you're able to create more technologies. Oops, sorry. So the first case study that I, I wanted to show you was my family's business. So um, we are florists. We have been florists for over 60 years. Around 2018, I, I came to terms that my next career move is to become a florist, right? My brothers are a little bit faster than me. And, and it was quite a unique situation because family businesses, one of the biggest bottlenecks to why they don't transcend well is that the, the, the sons, in, in my case, don't actually understand the business. They don't actually understand the customer base. So we had many different florists scattered around the province. And what we needed to do was really understand what are the drivers of the florist? And then who is our customer and our user? So what we did is that we actually spent, well, I spent a lot of time really understanding how do we generate customer insights as quick as possible and as efficient. Spent a lot of time with the, what we call point of sales person. So the, the person that's actually selling the product, right? Understood exactly what do they, how literate are they, right? So how literate are they? How good are they at communication? And how do they actually go through a sales cycle? And we spent a lot of time just developing this product. And, and what we learned was, for florist, the design is everything. So you have to spend, we spend a lot of time understanding the design, making it look aesthetically pleasing, being able to click um, and, and, and add in their workflows. The next thing that we did was the data, right? The data fundamentally changed the business. So we understood that if you're gonna run a florist, there are four components to, to a florist, right? It is death, so flowers for funeral, right? It is distance, flowers for loved ones. It is divorce. You know, families, uh, flowers for trouble in paradise. And the fourth D was Disney, you know, love. And you find your Disney princess, right? The next question we asked ourselves was, who is the, who is the customer and who is the user of our flowers? Any, any idea? Who is the user? Who uses the flowers? Sorry? Yes? No? For love. Specifically for love. Men are the users. No. No, definitely not. It's women, girlfriends and wives, right? Who is the customer? Men. What do, you, what do, what do men know about flowers? <laughs> Nothing. It was beautiful, right? And, and what we, when we look deeper into the research, the flowers behave like a Veblen good. That means they don't act like a normal product. You know, if you're in a situation, trouble in paradise, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. And when you're in love, what's the, what, what, can you put a price on love? You can't, right? So it really came down to the salesperson and how well they're able to communicate it. And what we did, I mean, it was quite genius. It's quite simple. We created a, a loyalty program, which was simply just to remind the boyfriend and the husband when the anniversary was. Simple question, when's the anniversary? And then we did this A-B testing. And we said, okay, let's remind them five days before, four days, three days, two days, and one day. And we found that when you remind them one day before, not only do they thank you and love you, they also pay more for the flowers. So that just <laughs> shut up sales, right? But it's a simple example. The second case study, again, comes from my research portfolio, was a lot of fun for me because you have a sports team, like Chelsea, for example, and you have a sponsor, and there's always this conflict. What is the return on investment? Uh, you know, we had a case with South Africa. Should we put our logo on, on the sleeve, right? And... I wish I could show you what the IP attorneys were like. No, we, we developed this computer vision system that's watching the broadcast and we can tell you where the logos are placed um, and how long they're on screen. But the key thing that we did was we said, look, let's take a case study. So DHL and Stormers didn't know we did this to them. So just to show you how the capabilities of actually scraping and benchmarking. And we said, look, what is the, what is the return on investment for DHL sponsoring uh, Stormers? And we, we literally scraped the social media. We found very interesting statistics. So as the team won, especially the URC, we saw that engagement went up. So if you looked at from a Stormers perspective, they could have structured their contract where DHL pays more for it. 
Um, and then we looked at their comments. We looked at what people were tweet, uh, tweeting, their Facebooks and so on. And we, and we saw that they had a really good return on investment because DHL delivers was one of their trending um, hashtags. We then asked the teams, uh, you know, what's your biggest issue? And they said, look, how do we drive bums to seat, right? And there was this issue of paid super, uh, paid uh, partnerships, so sponsor, uh, influencers, right? How do you pick up your influencer? Which one should you, should you collaborate with? And we just ran, a, we went through the, the followers, we scraped them and we looked at it and we said, look, you can, you can pay Peter de Toy, who's going to cost you a lot of money, right? Or you could pay this guy a fortune, Jaffa Jaffa. And if you give him a ticket, a good seat, you know, really good experience, he's going to, you know, push that, <laughs> that match uh, through the roof, right? And it, it proved to be quite successful. We looked at when two teams play each other. So when a South African team plays an Irish team and we saw massive engagement as well. And, and what these insights really tell you is that when, from a team's perspective, they can now value the assets, the front of shirt, the side of shirt, the banners. Um, it also tells their social media team how to actually go about their thinking about it. And then from the sponsor's perspective, before even looking at the team, they can now do the due diligence to work out what's the best return on investment for it. Um, we also looked at you know, ticket sales. Right, so you know all of these things that we're talking about really talk to the demand, the customer. But then once they come to the stadium, what's their biggest issue? And and we we spend a lot of time really on digital visualization, so data visualization, and we saw that the the components of abandonment, right, is something that we drill right down into and figuring out why do why do people abandon their tickets as well? And a lot of it comes down to stadium experience, ease of access, and reminders actually. Um, one of the key things that we did is that these are new knowledge. The skills don't really exist within the marketing departments of both the, the, the team as well as the sponsor. And we did a lot of upskilling on this, but really figuring out how do you take this tool, right? And all this data and build it into the strategy of, of their, of their um, the marketing department. Um, the next case study really looks at supply chain. Um, and this comes from a professor called Professor Arno Milan. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer doing fundamental works. These are technologies that are going to affect the hydrogen, uh, storage of liquid hydrogen and so on for an aeronautical company. Amazing guy, built these multi-physics tools. And what we did was we approached, uh, well, yeah, we approached and they approached us, um, an aeronautical company and really understood, look, from the aeronautical perspective, what do they want? And we understood exactly what do they want, what's their mandate, what's their new generation of of airplanes looked like, right? We then went and built out a specification. And the key thing from this, especially with technologies, is making sure that you structure it well financially so both parties um, you know, really benefit from it. And what you're looking at there on the, on the left-hand side is um, it's a liquid inside a container that is moving, right? And it's going to imagine it's taking off and you can see it, the boiling that happens to get the, the fuel going, right? So it's basically a liquid. And what you're seeing here on the, on the right-hand side is when the, the fuel tank on the plane experiences what they call violent sloshing, right? And what he's able to do now is actually use his research, his multi-physics tools, build this into a, a technology that's easy to use for the engineer. And the key thing here is that when you're building, uh, you know, these, these airplanes and so on, you have analytical prototyping and then you have experimental prototyping, right? Experimental prototyping is extremely expensive. It's frustrating. And if you have good analytical tools, it helps the design process and really save money. And also from a regulatory perspective, give the regulator a lot of confidence that your, your technology is going to work in the future or for that product. So just some key takeaways. Um, you know, research, it's, it's fundamental to doing anything that's frontier. Start, right? I, I know a lot of this might look a lot, a little bit like, you know, futuristic and so on, but start, right? Really understand how to get digitally literate, literate Python and, and just understanding the different uh, infrastructure tool, cloud computing tool, so AWS infrastructure. Um, I think a big thing that I just want you know, to really emphasize here is that a lot of it goes down to how do you take these, these knowledge and integrate it into your undergraduate curriculum. We did this, the undergraduate students hated me at the time, right? But you can see it now, the ones that really embrace this, um, these really difficult integration of digital uh, skill set into the curriculum are doing really well now. And also just from a postgraduate student, just allow for the freedom to experiment with these technologies and, and give them the, yeah, really the freedom to do something like this. Okay. That is me, hopefully in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Naidu. Um, that was much more flowery than I told you to speak about. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I believe that you were definitely influencer today. Oh, <laughs> I actually know what that means. I feel okay. very proud of myself. Uh, anyone else in the audience who knows what an influencer is? Yeah, it's a lucrative no, profession. It it's a lucrative profession. <laughs> <laughs> it's what your kids watch on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to open the floor up for some questions. Uh, please feel free to um, just raise your hand, and Dominique will provide you with a mic and put you on the spot. We'll take some questions from our online audience as well. You know what they say, when there are no questions, it was either a very good presentation or very bad. <laughs> so uh, help me out here, people. <laughs> I, I can give you some good insights on, on flowers if you would like. <laughs> yeah. Do we have some comments from the online platform? No, um, not yet, but can I ask a question? Can you elaborate a bit on how you integrate this into the undergraduate? Yeah. Um, what way do you do that? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question, right? So, so you know, when we structured the undergraduate curriculum, we looked at what's the exit part. So, you know, once they finish this degree, where do they actually go and work? And we we spent a lot of time understanding so for us, for my course specifically, a lot of them went to these multinational FMCG companies. So we phoned up a lot of them and we said, listen, come into it. Let's look at the curriculum that I have right now. And I want you to tell me where are the gaps. So when you employ one of the students, how long does it take them to become competent at their job? And that was really the question that they had. And, and they pointed out like key things that were op obsolete, if that makes sense. And then we took those things out and we started to reinvent the course, make it more practical uh, from the student perspective. So the students really wanted to understand like social media, you know, uh, uh, like an example is Lint. Uh, Lint wanted to know how do the sales of the chocolate happen? And, you know, we took the, the data, we so, scraped the social media and we saw that Valentine's Day, key uh, Mother's Day are gift giving days. How do you build social media campaigns around that? So, you know, it, it was very applied for the students. They were very interested in it. Um, and then we we looked at what are the tools to help them do this analysis. And, you know, we I want, personally, I wanted to jump straight into Python, but they were like, no, 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 whoa. So we started with Excel, we got them used to it. Then we started integrating Python into the, into the course. Um, and it's, you know, it, it just takes time. Uh, as long as a student is aware of it, and it doesn't influence their mark, right? So that, that's another big thing, right? So you don't make it a core assessment criteria. It, it, it tends to do quite well better at least, but they do complain, but it, it did work well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for your presentation. I really liked it. I love the, the, the flower model that's so, so <laughs> practical and really down to earth. Uh, and it really touches people in a very real way. <laughs> and myself and Megan, through, through Jason and, and Dr. Leona, we were invited to come here. One of the things we involved is innovation. And we in a fairly critical area where we, we've got a model of 20 schools, primary and high schools. The problem all the principals have is how do they enrich the parents oh, yeah. who are totally, mostly uninvolved. Yeah. Concerned, they only come when there's an issue. And how do they get the teachers to be transformed into and understand the, the whole age of of the digital, digital world yes. and we we as facilitators are are in that scenario of battling and and we've got at our disposal we're mobilizing uh re existing resources paid for by the city but basically doing not almost nothing worthwhile mm -hmm. so we've been given the opportunity to transform these young people and get them to be involved directly overcoming this gap of communication. And so we start with things like needs analysis. And, and, and just yesterday, for example, we set 
we set in motion teams and we've given them key milestones. So we've got the project plan, but now we want to, and, and, I, and I like the flower example because I'm thinking, how do we um, monitor this in a way so we can assess the impact and see how it changes the environment so that it impacts directly into the community because these schools have got students coming from a range of different, you know, it's not yeah. the traditional school where they all yeah, came yeah. from around. They come from com very diverse areas yeah. and problematic areas. And so now we're looking at, okay, let's do a social mapping, look at the churches, look at what social, and then because some of these students and some of these parents are bound to be caught up because we can't have our ambassadors going to these areas, they'll yeah. be, they'll stick out like sore thumbs and, and yeah. some gangster will knock them, knock them over and, and that will yeah. be the end of the program. So looking just at that kind of brief scenario, do you have any comment advice as to how we can digitalize it in a way so we get maximum impact because at the end of the day we want to present next year june yeah. to the city because they want this program of youth to continue they're thinking of shutting it down we say that's crazy we, we're, in a, we're in a world where we've got a youth crisis so um anyway yeah, no, no that's problem. a long-winded no, 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 but no. Uh, it's a brilliant good, good, good thank context, you very much yeah. so um a very good question I can just take you back to my, my comp of days. So June, we used to run these malnutrition projects where really looked at identifying malnourished children and how do you how do you get the parent to actually you know do the interventions, right? Which is very tricky. So what we did was we it, 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 you know it's a, it's a tricky one because in low income areas, if you introduce technology very quickly, it it you know they won't know how to use it appropriately and so on. So there's very good tools, something called a, um, a, a, a stakeholder con, it's a, it's a stakeholder mapping, basically. You map it, but then you map the, the value that everybody creates in the system, all right? Uh, the second thing is once you've got that, then you start to introduce commonly used digital tools like WhatsApp, right? Um, and we built a WhatsApp bot for, for the Department of Health, actually, uh, looking at their wellness. So WhatsApp was a brilliant tool to use because it's on their phone. They can use it quite easily. And the third part is the program management and the education. So if the child is the one that you have most frequency with, so show them how to communicate back to their parent and leave them with like a, you know, like a tool that they can show the parent. Because an another thing that we learned is interest. So, you know, if the parent is... If the child has interest, the parent often has interest in what the child's interested in. So that's you know just an idea of how to do it. But it's it's difficult. I, I will admit that. Yeah. Would there be a, would there be a possibility to to link up with you? Because I think from the university point, it might it could yeah. be of interest because it's quite innovative, and we really wanted to look at at innovative ways to yes. overcome, which which is right through the country. It's, it's even worse in other parts of the country. Yes. Thank yes. God you're living in the Western Cape. <laughs> um, so. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, and, and maybe that would be one of the things yes. because, uh, I mean, from here we go straight to another group. We're basically covering the entire city. Yeah. And, uh, and we want to do it as, as, as maximum impact as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Scope, scope decreases also. Focus is, is another important thing. Okay, okay. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Naidu. I deeply appreciate that. Um, I think it's a bit of an eye-opener, the sort of things that can be done. Um, and we're definitely going to have an opportunity to ambush him during tea, but we're having a panel session as well. So uh, please feel free to keep your questions for later. Um, we've got a, quite a few exciting presentations coming up. Um, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Jan Pietrus Bosman, and uh, he's speaking to learning technologies at Stellenbosch University. Thank you very much. today.
now. <laughs> Thank you very much. My time has started and there are my slides. Thank you so much for the invitation and it really is a privilege and an honor to, to be here and to share something of, of our very, very broad, because you can talk uh, for hours and hours on this theme. Uh, choosing, I've chosen some things to say and to share with you. But I'm going to start, yeah, and those are some of the things I'll say. Um, this wasn't ChatGPT that made the acronym. I just came to, oh, there's lots of P, so I just made everything a P. It doesn't fit in 100%, but we look at those things, uh, pedagogy people, professional learning processes, post digital and present futures. But we'll start with a party, which is also a P. <laughs> so whose party? And why am I starting with a party? So I'm at the Center for Learning Technologies. Um, I'm the director there, and we are kind of uh, responsible for innovating or uh, the teaching and learning side of things or teaching learning assessment, as we now call it at Stellenbosch University, um, and support the learning systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we are turning 10 in October. Why do I tell you this? When we started 10 years ago, the university gave us a name. And that name was the Center for Information Communications Technologies in Teaching and Learning. <laughs> so apart from that, not fitting on a business card, <laughs> we immediately were faced with a, with a bigger um, question is, we don't like the name, but why don't we like the name? And so there was a lot of soul searching and researching and thinking. And then we realized that the ICT is in front and then comes the teaching and learning. And so it's a very simple thing. And then we opted and, and agitated for uh, to have it learning technologies. Shorter, nice acronym, and it places the learning before the technology. So that is actually one of my big takeaways today. And that's the first point also is, the, is pedagogy. So we'll start, we'll start with that. Um, so what's in a name? We have now, after quite a number of years and lots of hard work, continually working, talking, using the same concepts, et cetera, we have now decided that for the university, our main approach is, we, uh, is called blended learning, okay? Um, and it's very important, uh, all the institutions uh, present here and online will know this is, this is a critical point because that term is so fuzzy, it's just unbelievable. So you have to be very clear what you mean by it. It's not just, yeah, we teach in, you know, face to face and online. I mean, that is, that's part of it, but that's a small part. Um, but we have found a way of understanding blended learning that holds actually our whole approach to teaching and learning in a way. And that would include what we talk about uh, as full contact. That's the more traditional um, way, you know, um, we are still a residential university and want to keep it that way. Um, we also have hybrid learning which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later on, but which is these, this idea of calendar blocks. The, this is a new direction. And then we've got some fully online, which is at a distance. So th these are the concepts that's now been settled, but it took a decade, it took really long. Um, another way to look at it is how, um, uh, is, is looking at credit bearing and modes of delivery. That's another way one could plot the kind of things that we are, that we are doing. And it's not difficult. We are keeping it simple. The point here is that um, we actually don't have any fully online courses. I know our business school is working towards a um, uh, MBA on fully online, but I don't think we have anything else. Our fully online stuff is more in the short programs, the short courses, which would be on this um, on this right hand top. And so, the short courses are non uh, non credit bearing. And our official programs that are credit bearing have the on-campus and the hybrid learning, and all of this is called blended learning. Um, talking about the hybrid learning, we're very excited about that because um, this is kind of our remote learning opportunity for students, learn and earn type. It's more postgrad diplomas, maybe MPhils. We've got some very interesting what we call upskilling learning units or ULUs that we are developing. For example, for catching up on math from, from high school, uh, there's some, some chemistry ones, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this website is uh, very nice. Actually, there's a video there that if I could have played it to you, it would have been very nice. Just explaining and giving you snippets of all these different tools. And of course, if you want to sign up for one of these programs, you're welcome because it's hybrid. You can do it even if you're working. Right, let's get to people. Um, 
You can say a lot about people, but, uh, and the one that I thought of this morning is the incredible importance of uh, having a good relationship between teaching and learning and the, the IT department. And we've built over 20 years a very, very solid relationship. And in times of crisis, that is now proven to be very, very um, useful, like the last two days, <laughs> we've had a bit of a crisis. But in terms of how we think of learning and learning technologies and teaching and learning, the point here is that we have set up systems where um, it is decentralized, but supported from a central position. So we have the Center for Teaching and Learning, that's more generalized teaching and learning support, our center that focuses in on the digital side of things. And then in the faculties, it is set up that the vice dean uh, learning and teaching or teaching and learning together with uh, what's called advisors who are academic developers together with a blended learning coordinator and i think that was a good move that we've um, that we did over the last seven years or so as well as the faculty it managers they all form a, a, a team that that thinks in an integrated way about what the digital technologies not only the technologies but what teaching and learning means at the faculty etc and this hub and spoke kind of model has worked really really well Professional learning is important. We've developed this idea of how the, the um, you know, the teaching professor or the university um, teacher uh, can progress from reflective practitioners to scholarly teachers, teaching scholar, scholars and leaderly teaching scholars. Uh, and on the left hand side there, you can see all our professional learning offerings, which are often short courses and there's myriad others. Why I show this is that on the learning technology side, the only direct one is the blended learning short course. We've got an intro and advanced. The rest are all generalized teaching and learning approaches. And this is one of the points that I'm gonna to make towards the end. I have to say something about platforms and, and processes. Um, we work a lot through strategy. And again, the strategy um, of the digital is not separate or separated from all the other. And if you look at this, these are our current game changers, um, program renewal, uh, reimagining assessment, graduate attributes, hybrid learning, the continuing of the academic offering and student success. There's no one that's specifically about the digital because it's embedded in all of these things. We had an ICT strategy, strategy for ICT and teaching and learning that's been scrapped. It's now integrated into our teaching and learning policy and strategy. And that's kind of the move that we've moved that we've been making over the last few years. We've added a graduate attribute. It's called the digital knower, which I think again, brings in this idea of um, integrating things. The technologies, I think I should just mention because it is after all about technologies as well today. Um, we've seen from the, from the pandemic side that the LMS, right, um, has become, has gained new life as we're resurrected, such an old technology, but became so important. And so we basically, have the LMS, which is a, a self-hosted Moodle platform, we call it SunLearn, is at the center and everything kind of builds around, around that. We also have these things called ELS, Extended Learning Spaces, which is our a new direction of being able, like today, to teach you know, in, a, in a physical classroom and have students participate from elsewhere as well. So we've got a nice project going there. We've integrated just the basics. I'm pretty sure all of you have the same. Teams or Zoom, Turnitin, Respondus, lots of integrations through LTI, and lots of plugins like Code Runner and things to assess, and the engineers and the chemists and all of those things. We make videos with Camtasia. H5P is brilliant. It's now integrated into Moodle and whatever you can do on OneDrive and Office 365. The post digital, I put a question because I'm not sure, but this is kind of the intuition I have. And this is maybe bringing together now what I've been saying is that if we look at our, our social conference this year, the theme is academic renewal. So we've never had actually a conference that's only about the digital. Um, so again, integrated. And I think digital is thought into, and I think this is a kind of a post-digital where it's not about the tools anymore, but about talking about the real things now, the tools integrate into them. I look at our academic developers. At, when COVID struck, they were, before COVID, they were the, the learning technologies advisors, then there were the more general advisors. And once the, the crisis hit, we just came together and we've never departed since. And I must say the, the, the lines are very, very gray between, between these roles, et cetera. 
my time is gone. What's now become very important is um, thinking about ethics, privacy, security. There's a big question about recordings and the risk for the institution, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about finding ways around that. The last point is a bit of the present futures, which I guess are the our responses to new things and the challenges that are happening. It's been mentioned already, literacies, digital literacies, AI literacies, chat GPT, generative AI have been mentioned. Uh, we've got a very big drive on student success um, and academic advising, which has become quite on vogue um, nowadays. We're also on a bit on that bandwagon, but we're developing platforms for that. Um, and then we really struggled, still struggling like all of you, I think, uh, with uh, with uh, generative AI, so we tried to to put some guidelines, and we um, we we in that uh, very uh, in that tension. And the last thing is, which is quite exciting, is we are building a, a edX course, and we have a Stellenbosch X, which is a, 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 on the edX platform. And our course will be higher education teaching in the age of AI. And as we speak, we are building this. So look out for that. You've, you're the first in the world to see this logo which is going to be our, our logo for the course and i think that is about enough hopefully thank you and thank you Liz. thank you very much dr bosman um i think this is really exciting and uh, i think the thing that excited me the most was actually your discussion about the name of your center right um putting the learning before the technology and I think that's a trap that we easily fall into. Uh, if we have something like ChatGPT, either you are extremely excited or you're an academic and you are terrified. Mm. Um, and it becomes all about the tool as opposed to the functionality and how it supports learning and teaching. Mm. Um, and that brings us to your first P, pedagogy. And that is something we need to think about. Um, we cannot change our pedagogy because we have a tool. We need to think about how we're going to change our pedagogy using these tools. How do we have to think differently about knowledge and skills? Um, and now I'm taking up your question time. So I'm going to hand it back to you guys. Thank you very much. I have a question um, that basically links uh, to what you've mentioned about the, the longer blocks that will become uh, in terms of your hybrid learning model. Yes, yes. And then I want to link it to the people that you've mentioned. You've specifically um, spoken about the blended learning coordinators and the yeah. academic development advisors. Yeah. Now, one thing which I think is, um, so I'm interested to hear more about your, your model of how do you link up the lecturer with these people that you have in the learning and teaching center in order to support um, online, uh, so the, let's say the asynchronous content that you want to develop. So how does that interaction and interrelationship work between them? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, support, I, I can also flag that uh, providing support is critical and it's through these people. And we also have other teams, of course, uh, on the IT side and from my center side, you know, supporting the, the users on, on these platforms that I described. Um, we have created this BLC, what we call network, and, and our center is basically the, the gel that holds that together. So we do professional learning for them. And so that really helps because you, you start to speak the same language, which is really difficult with a decentralized model because everyone can be doing their own thing and have been over like 10 years ago. Now, it's not that everybody's doing the same, but at least everyone is speaking the same language. And so it, it sounds so stupid like that, but it is really important. And those BLCs kind of um, have the same approach. They buy into, they know their thing, they've, they've been pro professionally trained. So the message going through is good. And, and, and when a crisis comes, we can draw on, on that network actually to, to connect people. But they really work with lecturers um, in, into the faculties. So from the, from the faculties, we, through them, understand what's going on in the organization and the organization, hopefully through whatever we develop and new things, we disseminate as it were, or implement with, it's all about, you know, teamwork and co cooperation, collaboration between everyone. And so kind of by, um, not by fluke, because I think we did plan it, but it, it's proven to be quite powerful, but these things you cannot do quickly. You must, you must have a plan and it takes really long to implement it. I hope it answers the question. Thanks. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Um, just a quick question in terms of um, all the, the MOCs that you guys are starting to, to look at. Um, I know there's a lot of youths that try and shy away a bit from the idea of a degree because mm. um, a lot of the structure is um, r quite rigid. Mm. There's not as much room for them to go into the their own particular interests. Mm. Um, is, is there anything in terms of the short courses and... Um, uh, through short courses they can they can create a portfolio for themselves in terms of their interests although it doesn't have this quite the same gravity that a degree holds mm. um could you mm -hmm. could you maybe elaborate a little bit about that at Stellenbosch thank you so much um the the idea of micro credentials I think come, comes up here it's a global thing and everybody likes it and, and knows about it, and I think thinks it's a great idea because it's it's so, you know, it creates this agility as, as it were. But it proves to be quite difficult in in the environment, uh, especially the the official, the Sakwa environment, basically, and what the university says about its offerings, etc. So you you are right; the short courses um, are um, play that that role. Of course, officially, one isn't allowed even to say that. When you do the short courses, then you build, and then one day you just announce, okay, I've got so many credits, give me the degree. It doesn't work that day. We still have the, uh, the RPL, recognition of prior learning. But with the hybrid learning, they're taking that very seriously. So they are really thinking into, uh, often the, the hybrid learning modules also are short courses. So somebody who doesn't want to do a whole one or two year, they can do that one really interesting part. Um, and then um, they, they also say that that will be taken seriously when you maybe then enroll for the rest of the PG dip. But, um, but I don't think any South African university, certainly not Stellenbosch, has any real plan of making, making that work. And just on the other side, unfortunately, uh, our university kind of plays, uh, and I mean it in, in a good sense, plays in, in, in the you know, bachelor's and up space. Whereas that kind of the competency skills, you know, is, is often at a, you know, at a bit of a lower income level. So there's all these, I know our agricultural faculty, they've developed programs for lower income and they're doing great work there, but it's kind of with industry and stuff. So yeah. there are examples, but it's certainly not a well-developed. Um, so our big thing is still people must come and do degrees, really. <laughs> Thank That's you. the short answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jan Peters Bosman. Uh, you see, I've got the full name now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, are there any questions from online? Just a quick one, if there is one, um, Fiona. Uh, for those people online, remember, you're not on camera, so I don't know why you're being so shy. Uh, yeah, you can wrap him up over the knuckles about that. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I really appreciated that. In fact, I'm probably going to hook on to one of your questions later in the panel, talking about micro-credentialization. I think that is definitely something that we need to look in. And you're right, the RPL gives us a bit of an in over there. So we need to examine that in depth. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Reddy. Um, and we should seal a mic for you. There we go. Uh, is that working now? Techie, just not that sort of techie. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. And uh, thank you, Prof. Archer, for allowing us this opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, I think, uh, you know, just to follow up from the previous speakers, uh, uh, AI absolutely is here to come. You know, uh, 10 years ago, 20, 20 years ago, we said 2023 is far away. You know, uh, let, let's start thinking about AI and all of those, uh, what you call fancy sci-fi things later on. But guess what, 2023 is here. Uh, okay, slide. 
I, I fortunately had some time over the weekend to watch this film. I'm not sure any of you have actually watched it. And this demonstrates um, Iowa for, for that matter, but AI, AI is the medium to control the world. So this, uh, what you call a sci-fi film, or is it sci-fi? We're in 2023 and AI is amidst us. So it's not really sci-fi, is it? So, uh, and then you, you, you look around the media, social media and other ways, uh, for example, the Forbes report 2023 shows us that AI is the leading our graduates at, at our universities, yes, even our universities uh, here in the Western Cape, to question whether they are job ready. We are fancy universities in the Western Cape. Are we producing job ready graduates? According to this new survey, students are very worried. Uh, and it is definitely our, uh, our uh, uh, what you call, um, responsibility, shall I say, to actually look at the challenges and the solutions from this technology transfer. HEIs, yes, we cannot ignore this. And as the previous speaker has mentioned, you know, our learning uh, technologies or ICT departments and things like that are on, on the move to actually uh, integrate this into our uh, academic programs. So, you know, considering from, from my, from my uh, stance, I'm considering the, the future of the labor market and checking to see how we can actually fill the gap between the uh, qualification that we are putting out there and the actual, uh, uh, what you call, uh, market uh, required skills uh, for the present and for the future. And it is true that graduates as well as employees are also looking into it. So we as HEI definitely need to do the same. And for example, 52% uh, of the uh, recent grads are saying, you know, they are questioning whether they are prepared for the workforce. Some are eager for training alongside AI and employers are asking whether AI has prompted them to uh, reprioritize what skills they are looking out for. And uh, actual employers themselves are looking for furthering and upskilling their training. So yes, it, AI comes and digitalization comes with a reduced uh, cost, uh, capital cost for companies and increase in production. But at the expense of what? Are we widening the inequality uh, gap? So yes, for the future and for the present, shall I say 2023, machines are taking over uh, physical uh, labor jobs and it is us uh, that needs to speak closer and strengthen our bond with industry to actually find out what are those new employability skills for the future that we need to prepare our students for, for the digital automated area. And in a recent study, it showed that, uh, you know, if you look at the 15, uh, what you, uh, uh, most in, uh, skills in demand, it actually falls into these four major groups. Cognitive skills of obviously the strategic thinking, critical thinking, whether you're in engineering, uh, marketing, uh, design, or whatever faculty you may be, but cognitive skills in, in, and in a very genetic way, strategic thinking, problem solving, interpersonal skills, you know, communication, all types of communications, uh, self-leadership, you know, uh, student-centered learning, students needing to take uh, and empower themselves with what is out there. And of course, the you know 12, 15 20 years ago we did not have this in the in our skill set but now digital skills as was already mentioned so uh digitalization of employability skills yes we need to know how why and uh actually try to 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 you know close the gap between our qualifications and the future world of work or the present world of work and using you know really novel technologies and such as gaming that will appeal to our younger folk uh, as well as the, the the more senior folk and network building uh, preparing yourself preparing your profiles for the international market okay not just the local market 
So at CPUT, very much, uh, you know, in, in line with our vision to transform students through innovative world-class researchers, to inspire knowledge production and innovation is the, that are cutting edge. We do seek to look for and identify or manufacture and develop innovative practices to enhance our graduate employability. We do take that responsibility quite seriously. And one of the solutions could be, you know, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. There are major companies around the globe, uh, you know, AI companies that have already done a lot of work for us. We were just talking about micro credentialing, for example. So if something is out there, it's reasonable enough, use it, you know, and include it in our, uh, in our pedagogies. Uh, for example, you all are very well, well aware of LinkedIn and the learning technologies and platform that it has for, for, for anyone to actually, uh, uh, what you call, uh, engage with. And in the 2023 report, uh, LinkedIn shows, uh, you know, what are the, the, the latest contributions from the employer sector in terms of skills uh, that needed to develop. And they actually look at it, look at it from a discipline uh, to, you know, discipline-wide. For example, in the business sector, what are the things? It's not just accounting and the finance, but it's a, a lot of the soft skills that really comes uh, up, uh, you know, as a, as a priority for finance, accounting, engineering, information technology, the medical sector, the engineering sector, the IT sector, uh, each of these, uh, these sectors have a different skill set to what we had a couple of years ago. And for LinkedIn, for example, these are some of the examples of actual training courses that students can do. They can do it outside. They can do it as co-curricular or extracurricular uh, components. And why? With the aim of developing their profile. So together with their qualification certificate that they get from Stellenbosch or wherever, they also have these additional courses that they have done. And these are certified courses and, and they are recognized. Uh, there's another uh, company on the market, Adillo, which has come up with something really fantastic. It uses the model of, of Netflix, the way Netflix works. So if somebody is very interested in design, or media for that, that, that matter. It continues to, to, to uh, share with, with the actual user all of the latest technologies in that particular area. So it's very, very big on content. It has over 100, uh, 10,000 titles uh, for employability of students to enhance their, 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 their potentials. For soft, it covers soft skills, hard skills, work placement skills, digital literacy, all the things that my center for community engagement and work integrated learning requires at CPUT to actually put the student forward and the graduate forward. It has a fancy technology, like I mentioned, uh, business intelligence, the data board, so we can include it within our curriculum uh, or we can uh, 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 allow the opportunity for students to use it outside of the curriculum. It has the abilities also to assess to uh, get students to actually take up uh, certified courses and so forth. It also has a major service center. And these are some of the, uh, the resources that it draws from Harvard Business School, Oxford, uh, the Washington Post, and so forth. And, uh, you know, all types of, of, of uh, skill sets uh, that draw from the hard and the soft skills, as you can see. And entrepreneurship being one uh, amongst them, you know, uh, one of the solutions to our uh, unemployment, for example, in South Africa and other countries. Uh, there's a, a little video here. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to play that. Good morning. I thought I'd just take you for a short walk through okay. the employability program and what you can expect to find there. Um, we have a number of resources in the multimedia that you have access to ebooks and audiobooks and uh, podcasts and external links, um, videos, and um, all of that type of thing. But we also align to certain um, focus areas, for instance, finding a job. So you've got your e uh, courses in interview skills or successful CV writing or job search tools online. But we also align to um, certain industry um, areas. There you can see cybersecurity, um, dermatological nursing, and so forth. And we also obviously have a ton of um, resources that um, address soft skills in the workplace, professionalism in the workplace, bullying in the workplace, that kind of thing. Then, of course, we also address the digital tools that would be necessary within the workplace. This particular um, 
uh, course is on the fundamentals of Excel. It's by Delo Create and it's actually a certified course. This is something that you could clone and certify with your, your own um, credentials, or you could actually put together and create your own certified courses. So basically what a learning experience is, is it's a path that takes you through um, certain um, titles that you might feel necessary as a creator um, or towards um, uh, achieving a particular skill or content set. So in this case, we've got a podcast, we've got an ebook, and we've got a video all around um, Excel. This all culminates in a learning check, which is basically an assessment. We, you know, you can decide what sort of format of assessment that you give them, whether you self-assess or auto-assess. Um, this would all obviously um, align with the certification at the end. There's also the, I mean, this is just one small example, but there's a ton of different um, templates you could use, um, as well as, you know, using a virtual classroom where you're able to integrate Zoom or Microsoft or Google um, so that you can actually have a um, face to face session with um, uh, your students that might be out on work experience and that kind of thing. We also, I mentioned that we had a business intelligence dashboard. The type of metrics that you can see there are obviously um, are varied and can be um, bespoke if you would prefer. So resources and learning hours, but also the learning styles would then start educating your buying um, patterns going forward. What sort of um, devices are your students accessing this platform on? And um, you know, what sort of formats and what languages are they preferring to learn for and things like that. If you're a multi-campus um, university, you can actually track um, uh, different uh, campuses as well as getting a, an overview or a comprehensive um, report on your full community. Good morning, I thought. Okay, so, uh... Yeah, absolutely. You know, we need to get our students to uh, keep them up to date with um, uh, employability skills and entrepreneurial areas. And there is a lot out there and we need to just provide links for our students to engage with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Reddy. Um, Wow, my head is spinning a little bit. Uh, one of the things that really struck me was the statistics and about two thirds of the students actually questioning themselves whether or not they've got the skills for the workplace. Um, and I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. We've always known that soft skills is something many of our students lack when they move into industry. But our students didn't always know this and they didn't push us on this. And uh, whilst this may not have been the specific focus of your presentation, I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Our students are now going to start um, being proactive in their career management, which includes holding us accountable for preparing them and preparing them appropriately. And we can only prepare them appropriately with digital skills if we are employing that in our own pedagogy and the manner in which we are teaching. We have to mirror uh, the skills that they must have later on. And again, I'm stealing your time for questions. So uh, let me be quiet and listen to the noise from the crowd. Oh, Leona. Unless there are lots of online questions, um, I'm just a, quickly a question in terms of time wise. So, and some of these questions run over across. So, let me just start with the questions, and whoever can respond to that, do so. So, um, I'm I'm working now backwards. Um, so, we've got from Raymond Crown: What is being done by universities to facilitate accessibility for students? accessibility for students as we shift to this online model, especially students from disadvantaged backgrounds? That is the one question. And let me do two questions. One from Enrita, do you find assessments, something along those lines to be more difficult now with availability of AI? Maybe just for those first two questions. 
Okay, I think, uh, yeah, so this is the reason why our office is actually looking at what's out there and try to, you know, uh, budget for this and make this available to each and every student so that access is not an issue. Every student would actually have that, uh, you know, available to them as you know, as they uh, learning uh, tools and they could access it, you know, with student-centered learning now, it would be their responsibility to actually engage with it. Some of it obviously could be uh, calculated and then academics would need you to actually take charge of it. I'm not sure if anybody else would like to respond to that. Thank you. Um, I guess the, the questions are now mixed between previous um, um, I'm glad about the accessibility question because uh, that is my big passion and we must do it. <laughs> we must make it accessible. Um, there are tools that can really help um, all the, as you know, maybe the, um, the big OSs, um, you know, um, Apple and Windows have now built in quite, quite good accessibility checkers and tools and things, even the, the office programs. I don't know if you know, but you can go and check the accessibility of your document. Uh, forgot where it is view and then check accessibility so there's no uh, nobody can say they don't know anymore uh, the learning management systems also it's now de default that it should be accessible to the standards we upgraded to a new Moodle um, it's getting better you also have plugins like a read speaker um, there's a brick field and things like that so I think these things are, are a must and then around um, I mean I think we've learned a lot in you know from the COVID time is you know, if how do students access? So I think the zero rating of our university LMSs were, you know, if it weren't for that, I think we would have been really in trouble. So that kind of thing, really thinking of the students. And the last point is keeping it simple. So you saw what I showed you is we are quite resistant to just take the best new wonderful thing and just say, this is now the thing without thinking through uh, what would it mean for the students and the lecturers to actually use this? What would it cost? And that so it's it's a yeah hopefully that gives some insights more questions um what has the student contribution been in terms of arriving at guidelines for ai use and then i think this comes for also for you jan from heinrich indeed um do you think all universities are ready for this, what you've been talking about? And in your context, where do you position instructional designers? Are they, um, are they the blended learning advisors? Oh, lots of, lots of layers. Um, I don't think anybody has, as a, as a, as a, as a group on the, on the um, AI. Um, we have, we have involved students uh, uh, drawing up the guidelines. So that was another question. Uh, but I must say there's, there's, there are tensions. Not everybody agrees. And that, so it's very difficult for a university wide. And so that, that's why I'm saying we're struggling with that. Um, instructional designers um, we've seen are amazing, especially when it comes to the hybrid learning, where we basically tell uh, programs, you can bring your idea and we will design it for you. And the we call them learning designers. We've, we've uh, opted for that. Again, not instructional, which is an American term. So we want the learning first. Um, and they've been invaluable. And so we've, we're learning a lot from that. The problem with that is how do you use that knowledge and give it to everyone? Because we've got, what, three, 5,000 odd lecturers. You can't have th that many learning designers. So our center's role is to try and, and get the best basic of what you can learn from those things and try and through professional learning have lecturers you know not get it too wrong i guess <laughs> uh thank you very much uh professor reddy um dr bosman uh, we can have a lot of time for these people to still ask questions um so don't think you're off the hook now you've only presented the things you prepared for you have no idea of what the people will ask you in the panel discussion. So uh, the easy bit is over. The hard bit is still to come. Um, but on that note, uh, we're going to move to our last speaker before tea time. Uh, so voted, please do remember you standing between us and some muffins. You better make this worth our while. So Dr. Gruvia, thank you very much from the University of the Western Cape. Right, uh, that's better. 
Okay, um, I'm going to do something the uh, UWC rector mentioned earlier about chat GPT sometimes sort of making things up. So I'm now quoting another source known sometimes to be making things up. This is uh, Donald Trump in 2016. And I quote verbatim, I think we ought to get on with our lives. I think that computers have complicated lives very greatly. The whole age of computer has made it where nobody knows exactly what's going on. Okay. So now I'll start my timer. Um, I want to zoom out a bit. So I'm going to briefly talk about the, the changing role of higher education in this digitizing age that we're living in. What are some lenses that we can use to better understand, maybe as institutions as well, the whole digital transformation process and the different tensions? I think in specifically in the South African and the sort of global South context, it presents a certain wicked design problem to us as well that we need to grapple with. And I'm going to very briefly talk about addressing this in, in practice. So digital world, recently a lot of things are happening. Okay, so we've got computing power doubling roughly every three and a half months to feed AI since 2012. Um, supercomputers, you're sitting with 60,000 parallel processors. You can do one quadrillion floating point operations per second. So everything is complex. Everything is happening at scale. And I don't know about you, I don't know how to write a quadrillion. So it's incomprehensible to me. Right. Um, then I just take a, uh, took a quick look at my social media feed yesterday. So yesterday we had Stanford, Stanford researchers finding Mastodon. It's got a child abuse problem, and that's the alternative to X or the former Twitter. There's various different attempts to regulate AI. They're all fraught with complications and difficulty. Generative AI has really been adopted very quickly. So we're dealing with accelerating rate of change, a lot of regulatory complexity. All of this is borderless. We don't know exactly, you know, chat. Um, I was in Polokwane yesterday and in the meeting, someone was sitting using chat GPT. You know, it's already been adopted very widely. Um, generative AI photography, we're seeing a lot of photos. We don't know if that's a real human. Um, Chat GPT is already replacing humans in certain human behavior studies, which is quite interesting. And at the same time, there's all these deep disruptions, a lot of replacing of the known, and also feeling of inequalities. So there's still 4.2 billion people this far, this year, that have been affected by the internet just being switched off in the country by authoritative uh, regimes. So we don't know what's real. So quite often, technology systems are unrecognizable. If you're chatting to chat GPT, you don't really realize anymore. You know, it becomes almost a person. Still, it's useful. You can supercharge your productivity. It's nimble. A week or so ago, uh, Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, launched Threads, this alternative to Twitter within Basically, a week, TikTok updated their code quickly, and now they can do everything you could do on threads. So, whoops, they just negated the competitive challenge within about a week. Um, Twitter, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to say we've got some unstable geniuses in control of some of these companies. Uh, Vision Pro AR systems are made available to developers under very strict NDAs, very one sided. Take it or leave it. Um, the actors are striking, of course, in it's not Hollywood anymore. You may have noticed there. It's now, yeah, they are capturing the AI images of the actors and then they're retaining the right to use it in, in perpetuity. That's why the actors are striking. At the same time, the same companies are offering $900,000 AI jobs. So there's a lot of unfairness. And it's sort of very final. You've got limited recourse. There's a very big power differential. So, right, a lot of sensitive data, 
a lot of issues, existential level threats, a lot of confusion. The Turing test has been broken. So what next? What's the change in the role of higher education? And I think I, of course, asked ChatGPT just to quickly draw us the university of the future. See, that's, that's Dolly, actually. There's another one. It's interesting, there's no humans. Anyway, um, okay. So if we look at universities, what do we do? We've got an academic project, the research innovation. We need to understand the universe around us, make connections, create new knowledge. We need to teach and learn, enable intellectual capital development. We need to develop all these competencies that the marketplace requires as well. Uh, student experience, staff experience, etc. But there's also the social project around community engagement. We need to speak to communities. We need to better people's lived experiences. Um, we need to address these big planetary goals. At the same time, there's also all the support and enablement functions that need to inform this. So, right, where the, have we got digital touch points? Pretty much all over the place. So, this is not only, and I say it with great respect because I'm also teaching, teaching and learning all these spaces. Yes, it's critically important, but this, of course, goes much deeper. We zoom out, it's institution, institutional wide, society wide implications. Right, and it's moving very fast. Okay, so uh, how can digital transformation in South Africa be rooted in community engagement? That's, of course, my theme. So I did what any reasonable academic would do just ask ChatGPT for the answer. So, yeah, and by the way, we cannot switch this digital transformation process off. It's not really going to work. Okay, so what is ChatGPT's? Uh, sorry, I'm going to. There's basically, in order to understand all the interaction between human society, technology, and the economy, we ask ChatGPT the question. Um, this is the type of interactions that we need to understand. But what is the answer according to ChatGPT? It's saying we need digital inclusion and access, we need community centered design, people to be involved in community centered design, digital skills development. I'm going to go through this very quickly local content creation, civic engagement and government services, sorry, entrepreneurship and economic empowerment partnerships, and then we should be okay. I want to say it's not quite as simple. But, right, what's the wicked problem here? The sort of AI-generated elephant in the room. Um, I'm a platform scholar. I studied digital platforms. And Benjamin Bratton said, platforms introduce a different new institutional form alongside governments and states and markets. So we need to start dealing with it and recognizing it on that level as architecture in our modern environment. Right. So if you want to, to read a very good book by Benjamin Bratton on planetary scale computation, if you zoom out, look at the planet, we are actually becoming a mega structure of planetary style computation. Fascinating book, right? But planetary scale computation doesn't look like this anymore, more or less looks like this. We're already going outside the planet. Okay, we're already sending uh, messages to Mars and so on on a regular basis. What does this mean? The challenges that we've got sorry, that word there at the top is asymmetry, um, is number one, wicked challenges. We've got very big information asymmetry. At the moment, they estimate generative AI and so on, generate 1% of knowledge and data that's being produced. This is going to be by 2025, up to 10%. It's going to increase very quickly. Universities and higher education used to be the source of the creation of knowledge. Right, big tension here. Um, a lot of this data will not be in community hands. It will be in the hands of 
commercial entities and sometimes commercial sort of hybrid government commercial entities. So, right. Second one is these big power asymmetries. I don't have time to go into much detail here, but seven companies make up over 50% of the NASDAQ. All of them are platform companies. A lot here on the other side, like Airbnb, et cetera, are also platform companies that tend to form monopolies. Right. There's also velocity asymmetry. So Netflix went three and a half years from zero users to a million. Chat GPT took five days. Okay. So we're talking velocity asymmetry. What does that mean? It means humans are not moving at the same pace as the technology. Institutions are not moving at the same pace. Governments are not moving at the same pace. So there's this massive disjoint here. Other thing is deep platform dependencies. If Google fails tomorrow, a lot of higher education institutions will be in deep, deep trouble. Right. So I want to suggest that we need to start looking also at these big corporations from infrastructure idealization point of view. It's an impossible word to pronounce. We, we often need to have almost be forcibly pragmatic due to cost constraints, et cetera, due to certain company being the only game in town. So often these dependencies are creating inequalities and fueling inequalities. Other one is seamless convenience. It's so easy to use a lot of these solutions that it's hiding all the enormous complexity and the real value embeddedness or values embedded in the design. Um, and then it causes, you know, the word there on top is invisible interfaces. It causes epistemological uncertainty. We don't know what's true. We're really struggling with that. Um, it's difficult to quantify that and to make it visible. Um, and this is unfortunately, this invisible uh, interfaces are often fueled as well by these exploitative operating models. Right. Um, I know my time is almost up, so I'll wrap up. What is the role of the human in the higher education? Student staff, academic support staff, etc. cetera. Um, I think we need to be wary and aware of, yes, I'm a unrehabilitated geek. I love technology. I love teaching students in this facility to develop a software developers and to build careers in the technology industry. But we need to be aware of the, the levels at which there's encroachment of these digital technologies into our life. Um, sometimes we're sitting in this type of balance. A lot of social interaction, increasingly digitally mediated. The technology are becoming more and more important. I've heard a lot of discussions around technology in the space. Everyone's saying, AI, we need something to detect the AI. But I think it's a bit broader than that. So how do you design for agency? How, we, how do we retain control of design? I think is the, the critical question. Right. Um, other thing is competency without agency frustrates meaningful change. If you've got certain skills, but you actually still don't have agency to influence, it, it creates a lot of frustration. Right, I'm going to, to wrap up here. Um, if I can advance my last slide, the role of the higher education. I think there's a massively high no signal to noise or noise to signal ratio rather, a lot of noise. The role of higher education at this stage should be to understand and cut through the noise. Um, the reality of planetary scale computation, it's a bit more embedded. These inequalities start, if you look at your iPhone, the cobalt was mined in the DRC under slave labor conditions, plain and simple. 
So it's very much a different environment or a different level of thinking that we critically need to engage with here. The power tensions, the role of the university to inform society, to ensure balance, to try and get this picture balanced. Then protecting human agency. I want to go as far as saying that's becoming a challenge. How do we protect our own agency? Um, holding power to account, I think is still very, very, very important. Making the invisible understandable. And this speaks to engaging with communities. How do we make all this complexity, all this seamless convenience, how do we make the risks visible? How do we make the real, um, the, the real uh, sort of impact of that visible? Um, right, and we need to perspective and accountability, not only around the academic project and our social project, but also support and enablement of the university. And on each of those levels, we need to engage with these tensions. Um, control of design we've spoken about, and I think we cannot wait for to, to, to act. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot wait for solutions to this problem to be built. We need to really act, uh, or sort of interact with this as a matter of urgency, I almost want to say, because of these, um, these discontinuities and uh, or the uh, disconnect in terms of um, the speed of the, at which things happen. So principles and values are becoming much more important. Okay, one quick example, you're sitting in a wonderful building, these students are products of this building. How did we do this on project level? How do we try to embed this on project level? It is very agile, iterative, fast-paced learning design iterations. We're running courses here. They're pretty much rewritten every time. Uh, since ChatGPT launched, we are already now teaching students how to use it to the best effect in a short courses format. Deep industry collaborations. How do we remove those barriers of, to the development of the different competences? And we've also received the mandate to be nimble, which is quite important in an academic environment. Um, and then it's research dri driven across multiple academic dis disciplines. Almost this radical anti-disciplinarity, which is a term often used by MIT. Um, so to conclude, I think we, the wave is not water. The water merely told us about the wave moving by. The role of higher education is to understand the waves, but more importantly, it's actually to understand the water. Thank you very much. Apologies for going over. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gruvier. Um, He's in trouble. Our muffins are getting cold or is it hot? I'm not sure. Um, something that really struck me is uh, something that comes from Arthur C. Clarke. We said any sufficiently advanced technology um, is seen as magic. I'd be slightly misquoting that. Uh, indistinguishable from magic. Mistaken for magic. Yes, there we go. Thank you very much. Got our sci-fi fans here. Um, and that's where we're at at the moment. Um, I don't know. I have some knowledge of what happens behind the chat GPT interface, but not really. It's a big black box. Um, we know this magic is has happening, but how, how many of you knows how it functions internally? What biases are built into the system? If we talk about recourse, if you accuse a student of using generative AI, and I'm using this specific example, um, what recourse do they have? If you say they've plagiarized, they can say, I haven't. And you can say, well, they use these sources. But if you accuse them of using generated text, they can't do anything about it. They have absolutely no recourse. And as you say, there's a great asymmetry in power and dependence that's been built into this. So we need critical thinking, not technocratic thinking. Uh, I obviously like my own voice. Let's hear something from you guys as well. Yes, thank you. Old man. 
No, no, I I fell and I, yeah, I hit myself. Um, I just have one question. What is the university experience without university? And I'm saying this because of all this digitization and digitalization that is happening. And uh, uh, if you remember during COVID sometime in America, students from your Harvard and so on started protesting. Why are we paying so much if we're not getting the actual university experience? Um, from your presentation, I can see we are moving away from what we know as traditional university experience. So. What, what is the university experience of the future without the university itself? How do we, eh, how do we build the culture? You know, back in the days, you could tell the difference between a Vetsi and a, and a Meti graduate. Uh, how do we inculcate that culture? Yeah. But, yeah, thanks for all the difficult questions just before the muffins. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I can only speak now from experience in some of the programs that we're uh, dealing with and delivering, specifically dealing around digital inclusion and really looking at sort of people that are completely digitally excluded. How do you make them part of the digital economy in a productive way, in a meaningful way? Um, and yes, you're 100% correct. You cannot do that digitally or only digitally. You cannot do that uh, without a hybrid approach. And I think there's, uh, in our case, there's enormous amount of time and effort spent on uh, support of students and, and really dealing with these barriers. I think quite often the inequalities in South Africa is such a nature that we bluff ourselves if we think we always understand each other's inequalities and each other's barriers. Um, I can also maybe just leave you with one last idea. I think what's critical to, to our approach is we, we expand the definition of competence. What's this textbook definition of when is someone really competent? There's knowledge, skills, attitude. It's your normal textbook definition. But we're saying you need also network. You need to become part of a community in your particular industry or in a particular career. If you became a lawyer, a medical doctor, uh, whatever direction, I think that's absolutely critical to embed what you do in the ecosystem around you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grevier. Um, I'm going to cut you off now um, before the students come in and steal our muffins. Uh, I hope they're good muffins, given the, you know, attention I've provided to them. <laughs> Best in Cape Town. Thank you very much, Adi. We're going to have a break till um, quarter past, uh, which means we'll probably only be in our seats at 20 past, but don't tell anyone. Um, for those of you online, we will play the sound of a kettle boiling. <laughs> So uh, please enjoy your break. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope our online participants enjoyed the aroma of coffee. Do we have the technology for that yet? We should send out invites with a scratch and sniff for those digital attendees. Um, I do have to warn you, um, I'm going to be slightly hyper more than usual because I've had my coffee, my caffeine. Um, yeah, it's going to get worse from this point on. In any case, uh, our next speaker is actually the CEO of the Cape Higher Education Consortium. Now, just to give you a bit of background, you'll see all the universities that are presented here are from the Western Cape. Um, and that's because we're awesome. Uh, yeah, we are, but that's not the only reason. Uh, the universities in the Cape have a consortium, the only one in the country, where all the universities work together strategically with the Western Cape government. 
Now, such consortiums, they've tried to establish all across the countries regionally, and they didn't stick. It hasn't survived. So if you're in another area, it might not be a bad idea to try and develop something like that. It's invaluable to have that connection between government and the different universities. We're going to be challenging ourselves with wicked problems, um, like the one we're facing now with digital transformation. But uh, before I talk too much, or maybe I have already, uh, let's have uh, Professor Eugene Clutter. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It is a good morning, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, this morning and to share with you uh, the uh, digitalization in higher education. And I'm gonna be a bit provocative for a reason this morning. And the first provocation, or well, the first thing I want to say, I think that universities are old fashioned, if not outdated, and will become irrelevant if they don't change. I've got no, and I've been in this uh, university sector for all of my uh, career, basically, for past 40 years. So why do I say this? Um, and it's too expensive to start with. Education is far too expensive. If you think about it, a, a student, an average student that does a bachelor's degree, spends only 18 months of the three years on campus. Why don't we have degrees that run over 18 months, which means we can double at the throughput rate uh, of our students, for instance. Now, for the first time, I think we have the technology to exponentially educate people at virtually no cost. And I'm gonna share with you some uh, of these ideas as we go through the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes, very short space of time. But just in terms of terminology, we say digitalization and education in this sense refers to the use of desktop computers, mobile devices, the internet software applications and other types of digital technology to teach students of all ages. I wanna say something about that. Part of the problem that we have in higher education, and also at school, by the way, is that the value proposition is wrong. So the value proposition currently is you get 50%, and when you pass at the rate of 50%, you will actually get your degree. That's for the student, the 50% or the certificate is the value proposition. For the professor, it is the throughput rate. So you often find that honor students will not be able to pass any of their undergraduate exams if they have to re rewrite them. What should the value proposition be? The value proposition should be like we all learn how to use a cell phone. I've got grandchildren, a three-year-old little girl. She could find her favorite YouTube videos before she could speak. She now finds the, on Netflix, she can find all of her movies. She can't read or write, but she remembers the names and the associations of each of those movies. I'm so afraid that she has to go to school. Because that brilliance will get lost. Now, the question is, what drives that behavior? And it's something that drives all of our behavior. Did you go to a workshop, by the way, when you got your cell phone uh, to figure out how to use the cell phone? It, it would have been quite useful, actually. If you have a, you know, a new cell phone to just go like for two hours and they teach you how to use uh, this updated or upgraded phone. But they don't. Because something that drives human behavior, and that is ownership and value if you have that combination you don't have to teach people and this is why i am so excited about ai and what is coming because the ownership and value will now be with the learner and then there's no limit i always say if we want to get our teenagers to get rid of their ipads and their phones all you have to do make them write an exam for which they have to get 50 percent before they can get the ipad they'll think that you are crazy but if you had to give them an exam right now they probably will get 110% on the use of an iPad. We rob that experience in our educational processes. That's the problem. That's fundamentally the problem. And we turn brilliant children into, we, 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 we degenius them basically. And it is sad that we do that. So the uh, human development over the past 150 years from linear to exponential and global. If we look at the history of technology, all of that is there. But what is interesting is what happened in the past uh, 100 years. Just have a look at what happened in the past as we exponentially start to populate this planet, which, by the way, is a separate problem. We're consuming 25% more of what this planet can provide. And that puts us into deep trouble. 
from a sustainability point of view. But the technology is there, and now comes AI. If you look at the, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, it's now an old term already. Uh, it's coined at the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos in 2016. Um, they say, since we have seen the speed and impact of revolutionary new technologies built around AI, machine learning, robotics, the Internet of Things, big data, autonomous vehicles, additive manufacturing, and biotechnology. So the th previous three industrial revolutions had a significant impact on education, but this revolution is larger and faster than before and will significantly disrupt many of our activities. What is an exponential organization? And there's a very good book on this, and this comes from the book, Exponential Organizations. It's one whose impact or output is disproportionately large, at least 10 times larger compared to its peers because of the use of new organizational techniques that leverage the exponential technologies. And we've seen the example by uh, Dr. Grevier, I think, where he spoke about uh, the uptake of chat to GPT compared to other technologies. And yes, the real problem. Well, while the information-based world is now moving exponentially, our organizational structures are still very linear. It takes four years, three to four years, to get a new course accredited at the Department of Higher Education and Training. By the time it is accredited, it is outdated. It's as simple as that. And then we teach this to our students. And we expect them to get jobs and build the economy. I am not surprised that our students don't get jobs. It's not their fault, by the way. It is the way that we educate them where the problem lies. So universities cannot, and the system in our education needs to become exponential and not linear as it is at the moment. And the larger the organization is, the more linear it is. So what happens is, and what happened over time, I want to talk about the demonetization as one of these exponentials because I, I think we need to demonetize higher education. I'm going to give you examples of that. There are examples there of Skype, iTunes, Teams, Amazon, Airbnb, and so forth. They've all demonetized that industry. How do we demonetize uh, our education system? I'll give you one example out of my own career. So in 2005, that's a long time ago, uh, I had a problem with our students having to spend a thousand rand on a textbook of which you only use a few chapters. And the average student right now spends about 30 to 40,000 Rand on study material during the time at university. So I did the following. I took a good microbiology textbook. I'm a microbiologist. And I took the index and I selected the 10 best websites on each topic. And I had someone to program this into a little flash program. So the student would actually go onto the anatomy of bacteria, immediately get the 10 best websites. At that point, I could not put that onto the internet. So I printed a little CD with this information for them. The cost of that, three rand. So from 1,000 rand to three rand. And then you put that onto the internet, it's at no cost. What was my role? To select the right material, which will still be the role with Chad GPT, with Tome, Gemini, and all the others, because wisdom comes with that experience. And to look at the study program with the study objectives and the study outcomes. For the rest, all that information was there free of charge. In fact, people were updated by information while I was sleeping because there were animations which come at a big cost. Um, and I just checked the other day, this is 18 years later, most of those websites are all still alive. So from 1,000 Rand to zero. In fact, I got sponsors, a company called Merck, a chemical company. They sponsored because they just put a little logo on the front page. I wanted to show that by time, my time, I showed that the other day to Elizabeth. Time is too short. So it cost nothing, in fact. That information was distributed at no cost. I actually thought that this was what libraries would do in the future, that they would actually sit with the different professors. The only, you know, and you've got resistance, obviously. One of our physics professors said to me, well, you'll never do that because this book that they've been using for 15 years is like the Bible of physics. And I thought to myself, what? After 15 years, you still think that this book is relevant? So nevertheless, you can demonetize and you can democratize the information. That's the challenge. And this is what these AI tools give us. Demonetizing, I wish I had at that time when I did the CD, there were no TED Talks. If we had TED Talks at that time, I would have just connected the TED Talks also so that they could get you know, antibiotic resistance. You had the 10 best websites on antibiotic resistance, you have four TED Talks on that. And all I have to do is to figure out whether the students actually 
know that information and we can discuss that information. So there we look at this. We will have un unlimited computing power, cheaper energy. Energy is coming down in cost logarithmically by the year 2030, which is seven years from now. The whole world will be powered on renewable energy. The cost of solar panels have gone down at a logarithmic exponentially. So the people that produce these solar panels are already looking at different business models because they will not be making money out of selling, selling panels anymore. They'll have to go the Google route or the Airbnb route or some other route to make money. So everything will eventually be digitalized, including smartphones, that which already, most of us already have, the internet and so forth. So what if we set aside all discussions of how things were as they are and as they might become and become concentrated on what they ought to be. Do you know we still do three-hour exams at universities? Does life work in three-hour exams? So COVID breaks out, so we get together as the rectorate of the university, we write a three-hour exam, we pass it, and now we can manage COVID. Most of the questions asked in a three-hour exam speak only to the lowest cognitive level according to Bloom's taxonomy, and you can test it for your own university and in any course. You don't get to the higher levels of understanding synthesis and creativity. You would ask a different question if you told the students, you've got one week to answer this question, and you can use any resource to answer this question. That's more like real the world. But then we even go further. We fail them if they get 49.5% and not 50%, and we cost them another 100,000 Rand because they failed that subject for another year. It's, it's an offense. I promise you, I think it's criminal to do that. We should not have 50% at all. No one, by the way, has ever been able to tell me why 50% and not 100% or 80%. No one. No one can tell me why our lecture periods are 50 minutes on average. 51. And I asked this question in the Senate while I was Deputy Vice Chancellor at Stanford University. You know what the answer was? Someone decided, one of the previous rectors there, decided that an eight hour day seemed to be like a good idea. Uh, so one hour lectures in eight hours and 10 minutes like a reasonable time for students to move from one lecture theater to the other. That's intellectual, isn't it? There was no thought into what are we going to do in these 50 minutes? And right now, our lecturers under severe pressure because the students can just type in the title of the lecture and they will generate the information in 15 seconds. And if we had time, I could show you that. If you go into Tome, I don't know if you know Tome, Chat GPT, Tome, and so forth, it will give you eight PowerPoint slides in 15 seconds on any topic you can think of. So, what will the lecturer do? And many of them, by the way, are bad representations of good textbooks. So, uh, one has to really look at what we do at universities. So school is not the best place to learn. Intelligence is not fixed. Teaching produces learning. We all learn in the same way. All of these are actually fallacies. Um, to learn anything fast and effectively, you have to see it, hear it, feel it, and you have to do it. And you have to have fun doing it. So since the brain cannot pay attention to everything, an interesting, boring, or emotionally flat lesson simply will not be remembered. Biggest challenge? that our students face in class, it is also my challenge, many years ago, in class is boredom. They get bored. In fact, we had 45 minutes was our lecture time. So I had 45 little marks like those people that go to jail that make these marks on a wall. And every five minutes, I would just delete and be very happy that I've now moved five minutes closer towards the end of this lecture. Boring, boring stuff. But if you get to value and ownership, have you ever, you've got to make rules to keep your children off the internet. Why? Because they don't find it boring. If you change that into a learning experience, imagine what you can achieve. They'll spend much more time learning that what they will ever, ever do according to your particular curriculum. But let me move on. I say it's when we have fun. The internet came. First generation to grow up with surrounded by digital media. Now listen to this. Books are published at such, such a rapid rate that they make us exponentially more ignorant. If a person read a book a day, he or she would be neglecting 4,000 others published the same day. In other words, the books he or she didn't read would pile up 4,000 times faster than the books he or did, did read, and his or her ignorance would grow 4,000 times faster than his or her knowledge. 
And now we have the internet and we've got chat GPT. We've got far more information that we are talking about here now. So we are becoming more ignorant by the second. How do we change that? The key issue is that the internet can only give you a commodity, it can give you information. It cannot give you the wisdom. So your job in the lecture theater when you're interacting with the students will be to impart wisdom and not information. Because the students, you can actually ask them in the class, we're going to discuss antibiotic resistance. Just switch on tome, switch on chat GPT, generate the information for us in the next 15 seconds. And for the rest of this period, we are going to discuss what you've Googled and look at the implications of that and the solutions and what does it mean? What does it say? And move the, up to the higher cognitive levels. So there are lots of ad advantages, increase the accessibility to educational resources. We saw that in one of the lectures uh, this morning already on LinkedIn and you talk about Amazon and you talk about Microsoft and you talk about all of these programs. I actually think that you could actually run a university without any lectures, free of charge to anyone that wants to enroll. And you don't have a limit on the time that they have to do the qualification. They only have to meet certain outcomes. It's possible. So if universities don't adapt, there are people that will do this. I'm going to give you an example of a university. The, that or, that's already doing this but no one will stop you or anyone and you might think that you're on a good track your innovation often happens on this side and while you're thinking that your model is the right one you suddenly wake up and you find out that you are irrelevant and there are many examples of that i'm starting to wrap up here so everything will become digital in the future um we heard about the artists in uh America that are now protesting and they are doing so rightfully. It will not be long before you'll have a digital movie. You will take a picture of yourself and you will decide which character in the movie you want to be. Just imagine that everyone will want to watch the movie and you get your friends in and you give them all different roles to play. It's going to change the world that we live in in unprecedented ways. So AI in education, we've heard about that. Virtual reality, by the way. I, I wish I had time to actually show you. And you have a lab here by a company called Eon. And you can Google Eon, E-O-N, A-V-R. And you look at the resource there in terms of uh, how you can use augmented virtual reality to, in fact, teach your students or yourself, for that matter. E-books, digital libraries, chat, GPT, Gemini, Tome. And many others. By the way, we are just at the moment at the tip of the iceberg as far as these technologies are concerned. You watch this technology in one year down the line, and it will change the way that we live and the way that we learn. So, your fast learners will complete their degree in one year or their competencies. You know, in America, they talk about the demise of the bachelor's degree. So, you, they don't care whether you have a degree or not. If you apply for a job in many of those big companies, they will give you their exam. So you're applying for a job in marketing. They give you their exam. If you pass the exam, their exam, they don't worry whether you're qualified or not with it, uh, um, formally. Then only will they grant you an interview. But the universities continue in the same old fashion, thinking that they will survive uh, by producing students that can't get jobs. They won't. It's too expensive. So there we already see that harvard now is planning to use the uh, 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 ai bot as an instructor in one of the computer science courses human professors of the course say the aim is to achieve a teacher to student ratio of one to one and this is what augmented virt virtually uh, augmented virtual reality gives you it's a one on one tutor you can choose your avatar it can be a human it can be an avatar it can be neutral you're not scared of it you can watch the lesson over and over and over you can do the assessment and so forth so it's all about accreditation and putting together the course for which the student will actually get that credit um, and with that i would like to uh, end off i've mentioned the augmented virtual reality digital libraries uh, the singularity university and perhaps some of you have heard of that they say how do we affect one billion people in the next decade and this was before AI, before ChatGPT and so forth. And this is becoming possible now. 
and it will continue. And it's a fantastic thing. We need to educate 200 million young people in Africa, 200 million. While I'm standing here, we have a 1 million uh, students at all of our universities in South Africa. We have to replicate that 200 times. Do you think that's possible in a conventional way? It's not. But we are facing here an exponential way of reaching out and getting those students uh, qualified. And I'll take some questions and then also the panel discussion that comes just now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Professor Kluter. You always have a way of uh, rousing the audience. Um, I've got a 10 year old. Uh, please don't tell her that she can have more screen time. <laughs> but you're quite right. There's the value, there's the ownership of the learning process, and we are degeniusing our students. Um, I don't know how many of you know the history, but uh, in Oxford and Cambridge, they used to not call the lecturers lecturers, but readers, because they said the students can't read themselves. Uh, that is a skill for a higher order. They're not qualified to do so. And the lecturer would then read from the textbook. Um, and I wonder if we're doing that with the lecturing, pretty much as you said. So uh, let's take some questions. Um, let's start over there. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Sisipo. I'm from the Department of Information Systems. I'm doing postgrad in data analytics at BI. Uh, one of the narratives of CHEC is to combine institutions, all four of them, to provide great, greater quality of education. Um, I was just asking if maybe is there any plan to do any data integration within these four institutions in order to provide data validation? For instance, UWC is, has been having space issues in terms of residence. If you can have data validations from all institutions, including Western Cape database, we can pro we can probably provide um, validation over is student actually living in Western Cape or not? Is the student coming from another institution doing the same course that is applying for in this institution? So we prioritize taking in people. Um, one of the other things that we emphasize for this event is system improvement. Besides academic, I really appreciate it, every academic innovation that is being introduced. Um, but also we are looking into system improvement of institutions in, in South Africa at large. And when data is integrated throughout the whole Western Cape, it doesn't only improve the system, but it also improves research because we're not only looking into attributes of this institution as Western as UWC, yeah. but we're also looking at um, all institutions around Western Cape to be able to see the patterns and cultures that they have embedded within their students and also look at the frequencies of improvement and quality comparing all four institutions. So I was just ask, I was just going to ask if maybe is there a narrative is or is there a, an implementation or maybe an idea that is encouraged about data integration within all four institutions of Western Cape. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I'll be short. That we two, the two questions there about uh, having more students on campus, but then also with data. So uh, in the organisation that I lead, the Cape Eye Education Consortium. We're just now embarking on a project to develop a dashboards for all many different parameters to improve quality of education, uh, accessibility to edu education, uh, and so forth. Um, if we want to um, look at facilities, and you mentioned a very important thing in terms of the South African context, and this is the number of students that can actually stay in res, and we know they perform better uh, than those students that don't stay in res, and they don't make up the majority of the students at most of the universities. But imagine. We use only half of the year at the moment to have our students on campus. The other half of the year, they are not here. If we did not have all of our faculties at the university at the same time. So you have, instead of 10 faculties at the same time, you have five that share common subjects and they do the first half of the year. And you have five faculties that do the same subjects for the second half of the year. First of all, you can double the number of students if you want, but more importantly, if you keep the student numbers the same, you can double the number of students that you put in res. It's a systemic thing that one can do. Well, when I posed this the other day to universities, deans, they say, well, this means that an engineer will not be able to marry a teacher anymore because they won't be on campus at the same time. 
So, but nevertheless, uh, that uh, be that as it may. But so, but data extremely important in everything that we do, everything that we do, our research output, all of it, throughput, and so forth. Uh, Leona, do we have something from uh, our online participants? Uh, well, good luck picking one out of the hat there. I will start from the top and reserve the, all the other questions for the panel discussion. Um, sure. The no capstone university complements the new education in the digital world. However, we are still stuck in a system being implemented by the leaders that is not conducive to the skills and competencies needed for our future world. So what are we doing now to change that? And are we still going to wait four years for changes in a program or new programs? Yeah. Second question, um, what are the pitfalls of database decisions or do we embrace this method in all in an uncritical manner? Now, the second question, we don't embrace it without being critical. I mean, that is what your knowledge is all about. And it is being critical, is being cross-referencing, doing your research on that and so forth. Um, just the first question again is, is uh, the misalignment between our students' competencies and what is needed in the workplace. Yeah. So and and the time that it takes. And what are we doing about what it? What are we doing about it? Yeah. The, uh, the 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 Department of Higher Education and Training uh, they commissioned the check with a project to look at a dual higher education. Now, what this entails is that the student will spend three days at the university and they will spend two days in a company where they work or that irrelevant to the field that they are studying in, based on the model that they have in Germany, basically. And we're starting to roll that out now uh, on a experimental basis with different modules. And I think that will go a long way to align what the companies need or the industries need or the employer needs with what we are helping our students to achieve. So that's what we are doing in that regard. The other threat because of our system being such a laborious system is that the universities are coming to South Africa. I'm thinking particularly, particularly of the Cologne Business School to set up a campus in Cape Town. They don't have to accredit their qualifications. It's on electricity. It's, you know, the whole thing is about management, electricity management. They don't have to accredit it. The students go there and they get an international CBS qualification. And that's going to happen more often. If they do it, why would others not do it? Uh, because they don't have to go to the Department of Higher Education and Training to f f wait for four years to accredit that particular degree. So these are the things that are happening as we speak. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Kluter. We are going to um, grill you properly during the panel discussion. Uh, yeah. So put on your bulletproof vest. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> um, we have our last presenter for the day. That's really bad. Eh? You got the graveyard shift. Ms. Raf makes it even worse. He's from government. <laughs> now you're all going to stop listening. Hey, so uh, this is uh, Mr. Marcus Rantz. I'm, am I butchering that surname? Rantz. Rantz. Okay. And he'll be speaking from the Western Cape provincial government to us because these engagements are extremely important. So thank you very much for coming to join us. Uh, thank you for that uh, brief introduction. Again, my name is Marcus Rantz. I'm a senior business analyst uh, within the digital transformation team in the Western Cape government, in particular in the department of the premier. So I come from a branch called e-innovation. Basically, it's an IT branch, but we don't call ourselves IT at all. It's branch e-innovation. <clears throat> It's nice seeing you again, Prof. We just came off an innovation exchange in Century City, and um, that was quite enjoyable watching you moderate that panel. A difficult topic, but it was very well done. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's it's nice hearing everything that has been said and quite um, interesting, um, quite innovative, looking at some of the stuff that you're doing at UCT. But at the end of the day, what we are concerned about as the Western Cape government is the citizens of the Western Cape. 
in case you didn't know that 70% of our population is either poor, vulnerable, or what we call transient poor. So what role does digital transformation play, knowing very well that the 3% who are at the top of the pyramid, or the 23%, the middle class, have got options. They don't rely on government for anything. You know, they can, if the internet is not working, they can get in their car and, and drive somewhere else. So how do we strike a balance as the province to make sure that digital transformation doesn't just widen the gap, but goes to the communities and helps with service delivery? So what I hope to show you here with our presentation, um, if you move on to, oh, rather, I should do this myself, right? <laughs> right, so uh, I'm just going to talk to you briefly about what our digital government strategy is, as well as show you, if it's of interest to you, what our digital transformation plan or roadmap looks like. Um, then some of our uh, design principles as far as digital services are concerned, and then we'll show you what the life course approach is. And then I'm going to introduce you to a, a persona called Timber, um, who is going to show how these digital services that we're rolling out as a Western Cape government are going to impact not only you, but are going to impact your families as well as the communities that you come from, as well as some of those communities in the um, uh, rural areas. And um, I'll share one or two stories about that. So, and as far as the Western Cape is concerned, just want to look at this. Um, there's a lot of demand from our citizens. And some of that demand is about either uh, improving our services or making it easier to access our services. We have spent a lot of time um, investing in broadband. As you know, there's a, um, um, a public Wi-Fi in schools in every, possibly every government building, you can access public Wi-Fi. That's why if you go past the government school, you see people standing outside is because they're accessing the public Wi-Fi, right? And there's been massive investment in that. And, um, we also spent a lot of time during COVID capacitating our internal staff to make sure that by the time we start rolling out digital services, our own internal environment is ready for it. So our first phase, as I'll show you, was about uh, basically integrating and optimizing our own internal environment because it is difficult to roll out digital services, um, first of all, for 13 departments. And second of all, we have multiple or hundreds of services and if we've got hundreds of services, we've got thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of processes and sub processes. And if you know anything about digital services is that before you digitize anything, you first need to optimize a process and optimizing hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of processes is difficult. So how do we go about knowing which digital services to, or which processes to digitize? It's quite a daunting um, uh, uh, task, if you ask, right? 13 departments, hundreds of processes, hundreds of sub-processes, thousands upon thousands of services. And I'm not going to go through that. Right, so in terms of our digital, digital government strategy, uh, it was approved by our cabinet in 2017. Prof, I'm sure you'd have seen some of this, or you've been consulted in some of this stuff as well. Um, but our five goals that are going to touch your lives or have been touching your lives um, is that we aim to digitally empower citizens. And that speaks to not only digital skills, but that speaks to being able to access services uh, on your phone from home. And instead of getting into that taxi and making hundreds of copies to go drop off at 10 different schools so your child can get into a, uh, into a school or apply for a school in grade eight or grade 10, you'll be able to do that um, from home. And that is one of the success stories of how we've digitally empowered our citizens to start using online admissions in the WCD space. And the story of that online service was that most people said, when you roll out digital services, especially in the space of education, you are going to create a gap in that only uh, those people with access or those people who are uh, well off will be able to access the service. And there'll be a, a skewed way of um, um, uh, sending kids to school or giving them places. But the data, again, the data always tells a different story. When we look at the data and we analyze it, it's those communities from the, what you call poor areas that show that this digital service is actually being used by them. 
and we can calculate the cost of what it saves each family from instead of getting into a taxi again, as I said, going into 10 different places, you can actually do this at home. And you know, as much as it's not a perfect system, I'm sure all of you have heard the frustrations of the online admissions, it is a success story. It is getting us there. And the data is showing us that we are using that data to make decisions. Where do we put schools? Where do we put learner transport? Where are all these kids coming from? What do the families do? Because you have to put in all this data. How much do they earn and, and all of that? And we use that data to make decisions. Optimizing and integrating services is a great one because if you roll out a digital service, um, um, and one of the principles of, of digital transformation is that you can roll out one digital service and touch multiple services or multiple departments. Let me give you an example. If we've got a digital service that warns farmers about a possible fire within their proximity, that same digital service will alert either the, the, the fire services or this and that. So that's our goal again, when we look at enabling these digital services, how do they integrate multiple departments? How do they integrate multiple services, sub processes, and all of those things? It's quite interesting how we map these digital services, connected government and sound ICT governance also, um, um, similar to that. So what we're looking for, again, I'll show you our design principles. When we design for one design for one touch and that each you citizens or citizens like yourselves don't make a distinction between provincial government where I'm from or the city of Cape Town. You just say you work for the city or can't you digitize home affairs? Can't you digitize uh, a digital ID, which is something out of our space, but because citizens don't make a distinction, we always have to keep that in mind. How do we want a future state where all these things are connected either through a single citizen digital ID, because we collect data in different places. Your ID unites you to your car, to your housing application, to your university degree, um, and, and, and all of that. So how do we bring that um, one single digital ID to sort of integrate all of these? And by sound ICT uh, governance, it's just to make it safer for everybody to access this and how we look at your, your data particularly. Uh, digitally empowered employees, again, I said that our goal was to make sure that we empower ourselves so that we can offer all these digital services. Data for better planning, I just gave you an example about that. So um, again, um, from a, a government perspective, this is the sort of things that we need to share with, with academics or share with you guys, students and, and uh, all these other institutions out there is that our first phase I've just explained was to optimize. So we were leveraging and integrating what we have. Our second phase was uh, expanding capabilities, expanding digital services, um, uh, implementing new platforms, even if that meant consolidating into either Microsoft or Oracle or multi-cloud and, and all of those things. That's what we did in, in, in phase two, which was to integrate. Now we are in year four and five, which is the point where we begin transforming. Again, digital transformation doesn't happen instantly. You did mention that it takes a bit of time. It doesn't happen instantly. It takes years, it takes years of planning, especially if you're a big organization like ourselves, you know that we have to report on multiple, how do we spend money? How do we do X, Y, Z? And year five, which is where we are now, we are beginning to transform. And Timber Story is how we are sharing that message of transformation of digital transformation. And I will show you that again. So single citizen um, form or life course approach. Um, I'll show you after this slide, but our design principles are basically to design for one, one touch, uh, one citizen. Tell us once, you don't have to keep on registering, asking what's your ID number 10 different times to, to, uh, to access 10 different services. You tell us once, we remember you. Uh, forever and ever. You register once, we remember you. We will bring everything together. If you called our call center and said, you've got a problem with X, Y, Z, it'll all come into your profile, which is stuff that we're actually doing at the moment. And um, one government, again, uh, I explained that to you earlier on. So um, our single citizen form or link to, to, to our live course is how do digital services touch your lives at a different stages of of your of your life in other words 
we call it the cradle to, to the grave approach or rather the life course approach. So your first thousand days, birth, registration, immunization, social grant, healthcare. And when you get to around 18 years, uh, 11 to 18 years or 19 years and plus, these are the sort of uh, digital services or services that you, you basically require from us as a government. So from 11 to 18, schooling, school bursary, social grants, healthcare, these are the services that you need. So when we look at this, this gives us a blueprint for what we need to, to sort of focus on in terms of digitizing, because this is high impact stuff if you look at it, right? If we figure out the first thousand days, digital registration of birth, um, immunization, social grants, and then we move on. And, and then by the time you're 19 years, you're able to digitally apply for your uh, uh, driver's license or your internship and all of that. These are the services. If we focus on digitizing this, high impact would begin changing lives, which is exactly where we are at the moment. So before I, I get to Timber's story, um, all right, I've covered that. I've covered that. All right. So um, Timber Story is something that we created last year. This year, we have Tembi Story, which is more future looking. But everything you're going to see in Timber Story exists. It's digital services that through our digital transformation plan, we have rolled out. And we've rolled out again because um, we have a canvas, which is our digital cup. A government strategy. It allows us to do all these things. It allows us to stretch um, our capabilities a bit more. It allows us to invest in data and it allows the 13 departments, health, education, to come to our branch and say, this is what we want to digitize. Here's the budget, make it happen. You have 12 months. So we rolled out digital services at a steady pace of 12 months, which is a financial year, if you, as you know, but um, without wasting much time, um, here's Timber Story. May I tell you a story? A story about hope for us all in the Western Cape. A story about the government working urgently to give hope. The Department of the Premier's role is to buy, enable, and direct our shared WCG goals. We are servant leaders. We can only perform our role effectively if we really, truly, deeply know all our citizens. We design and measure the value of our work to add worth to each citizen from day to day, and across each and every life story. We want dignity for us all as citizens and residents of the Western Cape. These are some dusty stories of hope with urgency. Please meet Temba and his family. Temba's story is how we are starting to use technology to give hope. Mm. Temba is a 38-year-old black male with a matric qualification and national diploma in business management. He is divorced with three children, does not own a house, and is currently renting in Guguletu with his eldest son. He runs a small butcher shop and is an active and trusted member of the community. He volunteers as the treasurer of his local community football team. Temba uses the Finance Link Individual Subsidy Program Digital Service to apply for a housing subsidy as he qualifies for it based on his income bracket, young dependents, and is a first time home buyer. He also applies for housing, and his details are captured on the Western Cape Housing Demand Database. Temba uses the WCED online admissions digital service to enroll his son at a nearby school. He is, however, concerned since he's unsure about the school's quality and safety. At the previous school, Temba's son was bullied. The school is located in an area with a lot of exposure to violence. Temba takes comfort despite his experience in knowing that should his son be harmed, he will be taken to a local clinic and if the need arises, he will be quickly transferred or referred to a hospital and all referral documentation will be quickly available to the medical staff with the clinical appointment referral system 
Cares, which integrates public health facilities. Chamber is confident that the bullying incident that took place at the school was once off, but was captured by the principal as an incident on the Departmental Risk Information Profile Initiative, School Safety Risk Scorecard, DRIP, application for further action. Chamber looks for new ways to graze business by applying for funds through the online funding application, searches for economic opportunities by searching for supplies for his butcher shop through the market information portal. He also I can see a lot of people have run away. They must have been bored. <laughs> so uh, we're going to continue our story of a September. Yes. Okay. Cool. Nearly got the female version of that. But anyway. Sure. All right. So uh, load shedding has not caused too much problem. I hope all our online people are back. And let's finish the powerful yes. video. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So if you could, maybe halfway through. Just take it there. Yep. ...of his local community football team. Temba uses the finance-linked individual subsidy program digital service to apply for a housing subsidy as he qualifies for it based on his income bracket, young dependents, and is a first-time home buyer. He also applies for housing, and his details are captured on the Western Cape Housing Demand Database. Chamber uses the WCED online admissions digital service to enroll his son at a nearby school. He is, however, concerned since he is unsure about the school's quality and safety. At the previous school, Temba's son was bullied. The school is located in an area with a lot of exposure to violence. Temba takes comfort, despite his experience, in knowing that should his son be harmed, he will be taken to a local clinic and if the need arises, he will be quickly transferred or referred to hospital and all. Um, there are lots of questions, so I think I should put them, you know, three per question, then leave it to the panel. Um, mm -hmm. There was first this morning, we missed something on Stellenbosch University to see, um, good to see the development. And then the question I would like to know if you include, include the social, social responsibility, responsibility aspects of, of digital, digital technologies, technologies within your approach that, that was specifically directed to Stellenbosch. Then, then okay, I'm, I'm just, just going to read out. out. We, we keep, keep on saying, saying that the younger generation knows more about digital, digital technologies, and, and yet, yet the average age and digital literacy of senior, senior management does not reflect that. So, so what, what plans do the senior management within education institutions have in changing that? that. I think that, that was to the, the panel. Um, then, then also the general question, how, how do we strike a balance between digital and manual learning approaches in mathematics education? Should, Should I, I leave it with those three first? first? Or? I, think, yeah, I think you're putting them through enough. Um, <laughs> there, there is about 10 more questions. <laughs> Uh, the good news is all of this we'll place on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so you guys can see the questions which they weren't able to answer. Um, or maybe they would have been. We shall see. Who wants to take a first step? I'm not going to speak on behalf of Stellenbosch, but I'm going to speak about the question regarding maths training. And I'll give an example of some 15 years ago. Uh, I was the Dean of the Faculty of Science at Stellenbosch University as a matter of interest. And we teamed up with a uh, cell phone company. And the objective was to provide part of the grade 11 and 12 mathematics syllabus on smartphones. And then we had a control group and we had a group where uh, the students could in fact answer and work out the problems on their cell phone. And if they got it right, they would get free airtime. So what happened was that you know, in any class, there's normally one of the students that knows a little bit more about maths or chemistry or physics than the others. So we observed what they did. So they were getting together in groups of 10, 15, and they were teaching one another. And while they were doing that, they were sorting out these problems on their phones so that they could actually get free airtime. So two things happening. Again, demonetization, but you personalized the training. 
Uh, so, uh, and the average, the, 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 the percentage was 20%, those that had the technology compared to those that did not have the technology without additional teachers. There were 20%, there was a 20% difference in their mark. Now, that was long before ChatGPT and these other programs. Imagine if you use that same model now to incentivize, to demonetize, so everyone gets a cell phone, a smartphone, and you use incentives to demonetize the experience uh, by providing uh, that value and ownership directly to the student so that it happens where it should be happening. Sorry, I'm sync on mic and mic up. Um, maybe just uh, uh, adding on to what, what Prof. Lutte said, uh, what uh, we've been doing is we've also been challenging some of the assumptions around that the fact that STEM skills are the be all and end all of creating employment in the digital age. Um, if you're talking about the digital economy, that means there's a multiplicity of roles. And one needs to really, uh, not everyone needs to be an AI engineer or a computer scientist. There's a lot of gaps in the market that needs to be filled for people that uh, want to become developers at a particular level. So we've had quite a lot of success in our program. Actually, I can... I'll, I'll mention maybe one uh, case study. I will not mention the, the lady's name. Um, it was a student that almost slipped through the recruitment cracks uh, in terms of the mathematics marks. Uh, and uh, we're talking 30% uh, for mathematics literacy. And she went through the program and is now working as a software developer for one of the subsidiary companies in the Salesforce group in a particular role at her level. But um, yeah, but I really think we need to uh, see the digital economy as something much more complex than just someone that needs to be able to code and now write the AI tools. That's not where the employment opportunity and, and, and the, the real life-changing experiences and uh, benefits to our student community is not necessarily there. Thank you. Am I now? Yeah. So yeah, since it was addressed to Stellenbosch University, um, it is a difficult one. I wish the person was here because I'm not sure what what was what the idea of the question is. So it includes social responsibility. How we integrate the tools. So. I can't really say something. I think I alluded to some of the things uh, when, when, when we said we think about, um, you know, how it will be used uh, by the by the students, the end users, whatever. Um, but I mean, there's no, and, and our new approach, as you as you might have um, seen or have heard, our approach is now in service of society. We've added that to our university's vision. So I could say it's just part of everything we do, but that would be a very precise answer. So I can give you the heart, but uh, you know, and the soul, but uh, no, no more details. Sorry. Well, I suppose uh, that is the important part that is um, Okay, you guys can ask questions now. I'm not going to give preference to the online. Here's the lady over there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tebo. I'm from the University of Venda. Actually, I took the, the opportunity. I was around Cape Town. So when I saw the invite, I was like, let me take this opportunity. I just want to find out in terms of um, supporting um, the staff within the university, um, how are you doing as, as, as the universities around Cape Town um, on the research side? Uh, we we at the university, we are required to automate a process of when a postgrad um, student applies and they are assigned a supervisor, the proposal, that whole process up until the external moderator and um, the, the, um, the results are sent to 
to the exams department. So I just want to find out if any of the universities you have uh, something like that where you have automated that process in terms of um, supporting the research uh, department. Yeah, I think they, um, and, and I like that you took that example because that is a very relevant example. Most universities have a very laborious process. It goes through all these different committees. They have to fill in a new form manually. Uh, and they do this five times, you know, and then there are spelling mistakes in the name of the city where the external examiner is and so forth. So if you digitize that, you just take care of a lot of that stuff. And uh, some universities are doing, doing that, others not. But some of the other processes have been digitized. For instance, your ethical clearance approvals. You submit your form online to the ethics committee uh, online, and that whole process is digitized. Uh, but as the Western Cape government is moving towards full digitization, I think universities should be doing the same. And I don't think the four universities, at least in the Western Cape, or others for that matter, should duplicate the effort. They should actually have one common strategy to say, this is how we digitize finances, this, uh, or whatever. Um, and someone mentioned earlier on this morning about working with information and with data and using that. But the principle is digitization uh, of universities is key. And the Western Cape government are ahead of universities at the moment. It's true. Well, we can take one more question. Sorry, uh, just, just to add it, um, so mm -hmm. I know it's not much, I'm also a postgrad student there, and so I know there is a system, but it's not compulsory. So I think the, the point is you should make it so, the value proposition so much that people use it. It's called on track, and I think it's used more for maybe masters, students, and so forth, not PhD. But in, in fact, there is that un underlying guide to your journey as a, as a postgrad student, for example. I'm pretty sure many use it well, but it's not again, embedded or compulsory, I think. Okay, uh, do we have another question on the floor here? Sorry, I'm gonna ignore you, Louis, you had your chance. Um, hello, um, I'm a massive technology uh, student here at the university. Um, my, pro my question, Oh, Mark, my question is for you, Prof. Um, you mentioned um, visual and augmented reality. What I wanted to know is what, how are you currently like applying it in like uh, at uh, the at Stellenbosch University? Like, what current projects that you guys are actually like applying it to enhance the learning experience of learners? Not sure many know, but like immersive technology, like has like AR and VR allows people who do not really like to read a lot to have like uh, to interact with whatever object that it is. Uh, it's mostly useful like when dealing with uh, medical procedures and also stuff that is mostly used in science, if I would say. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, I think I'd much rather uh, direct that question uh, to the university itself, to Stellenbosch University and to UWC. My general experience is that it is an incredible tool that is totally underutilized. And it's not only for, for anatomy and for medical studies. It is for thousands of different study fields. Uh, I think sometimes perhaps the lecturers are afraid to use it because it's so easy and it's so explicit. I mean, it will dissect your hand in whichever way you want. It will give you all the labels to the different bones. It will dissect the bones and so on. And you can choose, you know, whether you want to have the frog dissected or whether you want a, still, a, a stem cell. It will give you all of that information. The library in Eon is just incredible. I don't think that all our lecturers know about it. That, they, that there is that resource that they can use. But the universities, I could answer better, I think. No, I think, uh, um, sorry, I'm supposed to. Right. Um, yeah, there's 
at UWC a, a couple of programs that specifically deal with AR uh, and VR. And uh, again, I think that same challenge is embedding it in a Um, I think the challenge is embedding it in uh, deeper into your teaching and learning processes, making more lecturers comfortable with that. Um, and the, yeah, the, uh, the, the cost of these uh, services and the equipment and the libraries and so on is absolutely, uh, you know, the cost plummeted, the value add is is really exponential, but um, we must be very careful making assumptions about the digital literacy, specifically with students entering the university, um, that we assume that students have got the necessary digital skills to really utilize this in the most effective way. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Um, so we had a, a recent project that came in, looked at uh, augmented reality on health and safety. So they basically said, we don't want them to touch this machine. If they do, can you make it like a horror film? Like, you know, just <laughs> crazy things. But the, the key thing there was that, you know, we went into that technology. We had to recruit artistic people. Uh, so, you know, people would have art background, film background to set the design of it up. And then the engineers came in to, to do it. So it's a very multidisciplinary approach. A lot of applications, a lot of commercial value as well. Okay, I'm taking you guys out of the hot seat um, and placing myself firmly in that. Are uh, you uh, very serious about this question? Are you? Okay, okay. Before I get lynched. <laughs> the people have spoken. So much. Uh, hi, my name is Sia and I'm from the Department of History. And I just thought, let me just ask a question also, because for someone who comes from the humanities and social sciences, we end up really feeling as if we're excluded from these developments. So just as a wrap up, how would you encourage such a person who comes from such fields? And, and, and also, Prof, your view, on the idea of the crisis within the humanities and whether you think um, it has a future, um, a part of a future within this digital transformation. Thank you. Can I start? Yeah. Um, great question. And I'm also uh, from the humanities. <laughs> um, uh, and I hope you, I hope I could represent that. And I found out that actually is also from the humanity. Um, what I saw happening with the discussions around um, ChatGPT or generative AI is, I think, is very interesting. So the first thing is, everybody wants to know what must we do. The university must now tell, like, what are we going to do? And that that wasn't helpful at all. What is helpful is taking it back to the, the, the domains. So the moment a domain, like the history of arts department, uh, faculty of arts and social sciences, they, they had a media workshop, and it can go you know, even lower than that. There is where the actual you know, power starts happening in deciding what to do, because it's so different for different knowledge fields. So that's my first re response. Start talking among each other and to see, because there's lots of wisdom and, and experience in that. The second one is what is happening, I think, with generative AI is not that everyone must now just use ChatGPT. The beauty of the coming future is domain-specific ChatGPTs. So if you can start taking part in developing that for local history teaching, not ChatGPT's world, which is the, 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 the vast, you know, um, <laughs> co complex world of more mostly northern knowledge and not not our southern knowledge. I mean, I can talk about this a lot. And there's a great story to tell, like localized LLMs for for uh, indigenous languages. There's a story about a Maori radio, radio station that made their own LLM for Maori language, which was dying out. The big companies came and said, "We want it." They said, "No, you can't have it because it's ours." So there's something in using the big technology platforms to then create a very useful localized. I know 
at DWC, I think, is something about um, law or NGOs. Or, you know, so, so once you can create, have the technology and create something for the good, where you can be part of, that's the agency. I think that's possibly the, the future also for the humanities or specifically for the humanities. Now on the, if, if the future of the humanities, I mentioned very briefly in my presentation that we at the moment are on a earth overshoot. So we're consuming 25% more resources on what the planet can offer and the population growth is happening at a rapid rate. The population in Africa will treble in the next 50 years from 1.4 billion where it is the moment. In Europe, 100 million people will die and uh, will they lose 100 million people and also in China, Japan and so on. But if we look at how we build a sustainable future, uh, technology is going to help a lot, but more importantly, the humanities. It's going to be behavior change. Uh, technology could only take us so far with the drought that we had here in the Western Cape when we went to that particular day zero. What really made the difference was the change in behavior, and that's, that's a humanitarian thing. So the importance, in fact, in my mind, of social entrepreneurship, of the contribution that the humanities can make will outweigh the technological innovation. You know, we sort of defer, we talk about climate change a lot, and we see examples of climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to happen in 5, 10, 15, and so on. And there are objectives to cut down on carbon emissions. But the overpopulation is a real thing now. It is a bigger threat to us than climate change. Climate change help, might help to reduce the world population into an equilibrium where we can sustain ourselves through major disasters. But, um, and that's a humanities thing. It's not a technology thing alone. So, um, so, so I, I've been seconded by uh, our department to commercialize humanities work. So I'm spending a lot of time embracing and, and immersing myself in, in the humanities faculty. And I, and I realize that it's uh, very slow that it is a very slow moving beast. Culturally, uh, someone has told me they are anti-money at that point as well. So commercialization skills as well, but also looking at from the university's perspective, what assets can we leverage to allow for entrepreneurship to come through there? One key asset is the like in the music school, we've created a music label. Um, and that basically allows students to come in, use the facilities, production and so on. But you, you're leaving with a high quality digital song or something like that. Same thing for film and media, art, and, and um, so art, even looking at how do we uh, preserve artworks, but also look at rental models and so on to bring in those types of opportunities and actors as well. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, um, faculty to work in. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun for me, at least. <laughs> 30 seconds, Vote. Right, I'll, I'll take my 30 seconds by saying, uh, if I refer back to that, one slide I had around the whole planetary scale computation. Computation has now been with us for quite a while. So at the intersection of a lot of academic disciplines, there's also now enormous opportunities for humanities, for example, to uh, contribute. Uh, I've got a friend who's doing a PhD in digital archeology span because that is now a field that's very relevant. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, we, we must not underestimate the importance of philosophers. Uh, I've got one friend whose business card states he's a practicing philosopher, and I still think uh, he is more future-proof than someone that is a qualified AI engineer. Thank you. Um. Yes, so it's up to me to uh, follow up from these guys. Daunting task as is. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go specifically with the different presentations. You might pick up where, uh, where the focus was for a different presenter. But um, yeah, I mean, in our first presentation, just an idea, um, we saw the models that can be built. But it's not just about the technology. What made these models exceptional is the way that people thought about it. Who is the customer and who's the user? Yes, yes. Um, uh, and the interesting trends that they had, but the question was how they looked at it. I mean, the data didn't tell them, send out a reminder. That was an idea that was tested. 
Um, the technology can't do that for us. We have to ask the right questions. And if we have technology such as that, we have no excuse not to have personalized digital learning support for our students. Um, yeah. Our students, even if we don't provide the feedback ourselves, must be able to take their questionnaire, chuck the answer into chat GPT and ask them, how could I improve on this? What did I do wrong? Okay, so there's one use for it in any case. Um, we need to put the people and the pedagogy which is a fancy word for the philosophy of teaching and learning, before the technology. If we are changing because of the technology, we are doing the wrong thing. The technology, I hate to say to you guys, OpenAI has been working on this for years. Um, artificial intelligence has been a reality in higher education since the 60s. It's just become very, very present at the moment. An important thing that sort of just got popped in there, this is your fault, um, was micro-credentialization. And this basically is very, very short courses. So people who want to learn something, they go on to Coursera or edX or LinkedIn Learn or some of the free platforms as well. You do a quick course, you get a badge. Um, we've got competition, people. Uh, organizations like uh, KPMG, that's the auditing one, isn't it? They have their own courses, and you complete those courses in order to apply. So they're not interested in the university one. So you're quite right. We don't pull up our socks. We won't have jobs anymore. We've got to do better, and we've got to do faster. Um, I always do digital. This is very hard for me. My handwriting sucks. <laughs> Something that came up all throughout is social capital. Okay. If you're working in the digital, it means nothing for your employability if you don't have social capital. What's social capital? Okay. Have you had some experience with somebody that's working in corporate? You know his name. When he sees you, he'll say, hello, Joe, uh, if that's your name in any case. Um, that's social capital. That's what makes a difference in most cases about whether or not you get a job. It's whether or not you know someone. That's the biggest influence. So that, that actually came up a lot. But I also like that Professor Eddie was talking about the culture of competence. Our students know what it means to be competent and what they feel they lack to be competent. And we need to develop that culture. And that means as lecturers, as rectors, um, like you heard this morning, we actually have to jump in. We have to start using these digital tools ourselves because when a student comes to university as you said if a student's not coming to university are they getting the university experience but when that professor is standing in the front of the class they are modeling what that student wants to be and if you can't model the behavior of using the digital transforming minds and hearts and cultures and stilling the fears then our students won't change our systems won't change HR won't change. Um, yes, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. Stop me when it gets too much. Um, yes, we're going through this point speaking. I love this. The asymmetry. And I want to I want to reiterate his question. What happens if Google goes down tomorrow? How does your life change? How do your students' lives change? And that idea of, what was it? There was 100 million users for ChatGPT in five days. Was that the figure? Oh, two months. I'm, I'm sorry. My numbers were more impressive than yours, though. Um, and that, by the way, is a artificial intelligent hallucination. So always be careful with artificial intelligence. It can be as bad as Wikipedia. It will make up facts if it is, doesn't exist. But you spoke very much, and this spoke to me about the black box of artificial intelligence. We have to understand what's in there. We have to be able to govern, to strategically plan, 
Um, we can't just say it's too complicated. I'm not going to ask the question look like an idiot. Uh, we're going to have to get our hands dirty, look at our policies, look at our governance structures. Why do people still write stuff? I can't read this handwriting. Ooh, Professor Kruta, um, it reminds me of a story that I uh, heard. It's about this lady making a pot roast. Well, let's say call it the roast we're in South Africa. And she's showing her daughter how to make this. And they finish everything up and she cuts it in half and she puts it in the oven. And the daughter says, but why do you cut it in half? She says, no, but my mom always did it that way. So uh, this daughter goes to the grandmother and says, well, you know, um, why do you cut the roast in half? You know, how does it change the cooking process? She said, no, the oven was too small. <laughs> so what are we doing with our 50-minute lectures? What are we doing with our students only being here for half of a year? What are the things that we are not questioning, that we inherited and we don't know where it comes from? And how can they change everything? Um, when I love the demonetization. Big fan of that. And it is very possible. There is one thing that you, oh, wait, Marcus, you brought the people back into this, okay? Um, from the excitement to you have a responsibility sitting right here. You have a responsibility to change it for people. Forget the politics, forget the silos. Um, the power is in fact working across silos, having your information, flow in, in different directions. So remember your responsibility. When you're working with that number, it represents a person. And you guys failed miserably at one thing. Okay, now you, you did sort of mention it sometimes. Seeing that I've got the mic, I will speak to it, and then you guys can eat. I asked Chad GPT to provide me with a list of the top 10 scientists of all times. He gave me the list. And then I asked ChatGTP, are there any biases in this list? And he says, yes, there's a bias towards Europeans, there's a bias towards men, and there's a bias towards hard sciences. He says, but it's not my fault. I didn't quite put it in that way. He says, this is a reflection on the societal beliefs and the culture and the data out there, right? We live in Africa. We've got to decolonize chat GPT. We've got to train it differently. We can create our own models. But the biases that is prevalent in society is in the data and the tools that we are using. Do not lose sight of this. I know a lot of people run when we speak about decoloniality, but it's very real. And our AI needs to be decolonized. So on that note, I invite you to the most important thing, which is the food. Please be so kind to give back your name tags because uh, here we reuse and recycle. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. If you do mock, our presenters, um, sorry guys, you're on your own time now. We only took responsibility for parking. Thank you very much.